where the camera's at the top. Hello, everyone. We're live. Well, according to the computer, we're live. So uh, let me know in the comments how the sound is, if we're loud enough, or if we are too quiet. I can change my, uh, my microphone here to a higher volume, and I just want to make sure we got that right before we go too far into this. So the plan of attack on this episode is obviously I'm back and uh, Janice, I, know. I know Janice and I missed each other dearly. So yeah. I'm going to answer all the questions that I would assume a viewer would want to see. Like one of one right off the top is knowing what you know now, would you do this uh, eight week voyage again? Uh, was it too long? Was it too short? Was it? Oh yeah. yeah. And show, she showed me this at the airport yesterday. <laughs> so that was my uh, surprise at the airport is that she uh, had a bad car accident. So yeah. She posted like, something on Facebook. I got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had a car accident two weeks ago. Two and a half weeks ago. And rode off her car. Yeah, totally. And I kind of found out some weird stuff when I was texting her from the boat, just like, how are things going? And, and then she mentioned in passing that she was using my car. And I thought, why would she use my car? She has her own car. And uh, I never figured out why until I met her at the airport and saw the cast. So, so poor baby. Yes. But she didn't tell me because she didn't yeah. want it to ruin my uh, my thing. Because he couldn't do shit about it, and he would just yeah, lie. yeah. And then I would worry. I probably would have come home sooner. Because you would have come home from Brazil. I knew it, so that's why I mentioned. Yeah. It. Sound is good. Okay. Uh, yes. Sorry to hear about Janice's MVC, and uh, yeah. So it sounds like everything's good. All right. So first of all, um, yeah. So let's just go over it for anybody who doesn't know the various stops. I'm going to start with that and say uh, what about the various stops were good. Or, or not so good. And also just the living conditions on the boat, whether it was something uh, I found hard or whether it was easy. And there was definitely some hardships. We'll get into uh, that. Some people who watch Facebook um, posts might've gotten a little bit of heads up of things that have gone on on the trip because uh, there was a little bit when we found basic internet, we did post a few photos or some of the other crew did and tagged me. So you might know a little bit already. So the first place we went was, uh, obviously Cape Town where the boat is built. And the only episode I was able to have fine time to do was the factory tour. So if you haven't seen that, the boat I went on was the Exquisite X5 and uh, uh, it was a beautiful boat. And I never, you know, you, you go to a boat show like Annapolis and it's a beautiful boat on the dock, but you always wonder how does it sail? So that was the big thing. And Tomas, the owner of the company had taken Janice and I out at the I last Annapolis show. Yeah, for a test sail. But of course, knowing our luck, it was like no wind. So it wasn't the best example of sailing, like how it really sailed. So this, of course, was a massive long you know, test sail. Mm -hmm. So now I definitely know how it sails. So uh, I'll get to that in a second in the sailing conditions. But Cape Town, I flew on, on the 17th. I left in the 16th. Takes 26 hours to get from Ottawa. I went Ottawa to Montreal, Montreal to uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam to South Africa. So 26 hours in total. So it was very, very tiring. It's halfway around the world. And um, when I got there, another uh, gentleman from uh, Maverick picked me up and took me to his house to stay overnight. And then I did a Maverick uh, factory tour. And then a two or three or four days after that, the next day I went to the Exquisite boat and slept on it. And then two or three days later, I did the factory tour of Phoenix where the Exquisite is built and was super impressed. Again, the boat seems great at the dock. I now know it sails quite well, uh, but the quality and workmanship was just blew me away. And I'm not saying that because I'm not paid by Phoenix Marine who builds it or exquisite or anything to say anything. It was my, just, I was just blown away by the quality. So if you haven't seen that one episode that got out there, uh, that was a factory tour. Um, after I did the tour, they asked if I'd have time to release that before I left. And uh, I said, well, the boat where I was on, they were still working on it. So uh, Clinton, the owner of Phoenix Marine said, how would I put you in a hotel? Because there was no decent Wi-Fi at the yacht club. In fact, every stop we went to, that was the big, problem everywhere was we couldn't yeah. find good Wi-Fi. Um, so he put me in a hotel just for a night or two and that, and that let me have peace and quiet to focus on editing and a good internet to upload it. So I uploaded that one because that was the one that the Phoenix Marine was most excited for me to get out. So it's a little out of order because day one, day two, day three were not in episodes yet and all of a sudden whatever day four or day five I do this exquisite tour and people might wonder why I did that out of order but that's the reason. So um, Cape Town, we were there 10 extra days. I was flew in on the 17th. We were supposed to sail away on the 20th. And then we didn't end up sailing out to the 30th, 10 extra days. And the reason for that is uh, Sean and uh, Phoenix had applied for a US Coast Guard certification number. Yeah, you're, she's reading the comments. Yeah. So if you're commenting, yeah. she, 
Um, so the U.S. Coast Guard thing, they paid for an expedited number. And then it just kept not showing up. And then they kept emailing and what's going on, what's going on. And, and they just got the runaround. Um, so long and short, we couldn't leave until that boat was properly registered with the U.S. Coast Guard because Sean is American and he needed the boat to be properly registered before we leave. And it's part of the sale of the boat. You need to have it properly registered and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So because of that, I got 10 extra days in Cape Town that I wasn't expecting, but uh, we did some touristy stuff. Um, Clinton, the owner of Phoenix Marine, took us on a huge drive. We went to uh, Cape Hope, which is the kind of the most Southern point of Africa. And it was super cool to see that, very windy. Um, most of the time down in Cape Town area was super windy. So I never got to do any drone flying um, while I was down there because it was just way too windy. I uh, went to the top of Table Mountain, uh, another uh, lookout mountain that looks right down on the city, filmed all that stuff. Went on a safari, which was cool. Um, what else did I do? Oh, I saw the penguins. Yeah. Saw the penguins. And so I did a lot of stuff during that time. So I didn't just sit on the boat twiddling my thumbs. I did a lot of touristy stuff. So anybody who's interested in, in Cape Town and whether it's worth stopping there, A, 100% yes. Um, Cape Town is beautiful. It's felt safe. Now, I know a lot of people said South Africa can be very violent and dangerous. Not in Cape Town. Cape Town is definitely more safe than, let's say, Johannesburg, from what I've been told. I've done a lot of talking to locals, and they're like, Cape Town, you're fine mostly. There are some shady neighborhoods away from the waterfront that maybe you'd be less fine if you're walking around alone with expensive camera gear like I was. Um, but Cape Town near the waterfront, the VNA waterfront, is super safe. There's malls, restaurants, there's a ton of like waterfront security guards walking around. So never at any time did we feel uh, unsafe. And I told Genesis is definitely mm -hmm. a place that we're gonna have to visit. Yes. When we do our trans or circumnavigation, we're gonna do the route around Cape Town or around South Africa. We're not gonna go through the Suez Canal. We nope. ruled that out as a possibility. Nope. So uh, we'll definitely do the same route. And when we do, we'll start, when we come down, probably past um, Madagascar, we'll come down uh, along the South African coast. And um, from what I know, I'll probably stop at, uh, is it Durban? Uh, and then keep going. And there's a bunch of ports along the way you can stop and then eventually get to uh, Cape Town. Show her all those things that I got to experience Yay. that she didn't because she was a little jealous of all the things I missed. Yeah. Like you wanted to see the penguins. Next time. Yeah, and uh, Table Mountain is beautiful. So um, I would have had to take a uh, leave without pay to go this time. Yeah. Next time I will do mm. necessary. Yeah, kind of jumping ahead. This was way, way too long for me to be away from Janice. I missed her too much. Um, home is where the heart is, they always say. And even though I was on a great, amazing boat and experiencing a lot of things for the first time, it would just felt weird to not do it with Janice. Every time I did something and I told her in text messages, uh, it was great. She'd go, we have to do that together at some point. So I knew all these things I got to do. I'm from with me. Yeah, I'm going to have to do this all again. So um, that was the first port, which of course I got more than enough time to experience. And it was, it was great. So from there, now I don't, obviously this is live, so I don't have the ability to throw a map up. Just visualize or go to Google Maps. We went north along the African coast. Uh, 800 and something miles, so about five days sailing um, to Namibia, Walvis Bay, Namibia. Uh, now, the prevailing winds were pretty much from the south, so we had winds mostly directly behind us. Uh, so it was, uh, and it was windy, like I tell you, it was windy and freaking cold. I told you about that. Mm -hmm. it, there is an Antarctic current that runs up the west coast of Africa, and so when you leave Cape Town, it is freezing cold, especially at night. Uh, the water was like 42 degrees Fahrenheit, um, American boats, they always, they always quoted everything in Fahrenheit. Um, I don't remember what that would be in Celsius, but it's low. It's very, very cold. Um, so at night, as soon as the sun went over the horizon, the temperature dropped like crazy. I ended up having to buy long underwear to go under my jeans, and then I had like splash pants if I needed that, but we weren't getting rained on, but it was just freezing. Wore long underwear, multiple layers of sweatshirts. I think I had like five layers on. So be prepared. If you're going to leave in the winter time from Cape Town, it is freaking cold. And it was cold all the way past Namibia until we were about halfway to St. Helena. But going back to uh, Namibia, we pulled in there. It was a service stop. It was meant for Tomas, the owner of the company who joined us on the first uh, leg, to get off and fly home. And they also had some service crew coming to meet us there to do, like this was our first real test sale of this brand new boat. So they tweaked it and did a bunch of stuff to the boat. That was pre-planned. Um, so that was the reason we stopped there. I think we agree as a crew that if you had to, if you were in a rush to get to St. Helena, you could probably just skip Namibia. Uh, when you pull into the Anchorage 
it's very, very industrial. Like you go in and it's like loading cranes and freighters and uh, all this stuff. Just click over there. There you go. She's <laughs> disappeared our screen. Um, so uh, yeah, we I pulled in and we were all making comments on the video. Wow, this place is not pretty. Why did we stop here again? And um, but the one thing you you learn about Namibia, the people are super friendly. It's it's a mainland coast so it, like there's normal cars and you know it's it's built up there's normal grocery stores everybody pay you, you can pay everything restaurants or grocery stores with credit cards which you think okay that's normal right but it's actually not normal when you see some of the next stops we go to so um once we got on shore there's all these excursions from walvis bay to the dunes or to uh there's a town north of it, it's like a touristy town that's sort of german based it's called I'm off the top of my head, Swack Up or something like that. And everybody told me we should go there. But um, but long and short, it was worth going there once you get past the fact that the actual anchorage where you're in is quite industrial and not very pretty. Uh, tons of fun things happen there, though. The uh, local tour groups, there's a bunch of scuba excursions and... Um, I don't know what they're... I'd ask me to hit like and hit the thumbs up, but I can't figure out how to okay. click on comments and stuff. You're in the emojis there. No, I know, but like if, when I click on the three dots on the side, it doesn't oh. give me an option to do things like. Yeah, she's just not going to be. Able I don't to. know what time. Okay, it. sorry, she can't <laughs> put a thumbs up. She's just going to comment, write something, or. Uh... Uh, thanks for uh... that. So back to uh, Nibia. So that we were just the videos are going to blow you away. We had. Um... Okay, you're being very distracting I'm with sorry, typing I'm while sorry. I'm trying to talk. I'm doing one-handed typing. Okay, this is a one-time thumbs up comment. <laughs> I only have one hand to take. <laughs> I can't now. I can't get it to go on. Uh, enter. Poke. No, because you're oh. in the emoji area. Oops. Search emoji. Oh, say oh, something. It's up here. The wrong spot. <laughs> For all of you. <laughs> Thanks. Janice can't type. <laughs> um. So yeah, that while we were there, we couldn't we couldn't believe it. Like these massive pelicans. <laughs> She keeps trying to do another thing. <laughs> She's got ADD. Um, these massive pelicans, like five of them, landed on her boat while we were moving. And I'm filming that with my camera and my gimbal. And there's uh, Neil sitting literally in the middle of them. And their beaks are like, these birds are huge. Their beaks are huge. And they're right near his face. Um, and then all of a sudden, while we're doing that, they go, check this out. And I turn around and there's this massive like Cape seal or a sea lion on the back of our boat. And we were moving at five or six knots. So this thing must have launched itself out of the water while we were moving and landed on the back of the boat. And we found out from other locals that the seals do that because the local um, uh, scuba clubs and stuff that go out there, they feed them. So these things get so used to landing on the boat and and uh, and getting fed that that's what they did. They just, everything landed on our boat while we were filmed, of course, all that. So that's coming up. So Namibia was worth going but um, not pretty. Let's just go with that. If you want to do excursions on shore, great. It's actually not bad for uh, if you need to get reprovisioned diesel. It was the cheapest diesel we found. So Sean was always upping, uh, filling our tanks with diesel at every stop. And that was probably the cheapest place to get diesel. Next stop, was there something you want to say? I haven't been reading the I comments. I was just saying, yeah, Marcel D says, we have to hit the like button, not you. Okay, so mm. that was other yes. viewers, not us. <laughs> yes, great. Thank you. Like, you're confusing the hell out of her here. Yes. Just trying to do things that aren't I'm even available. Wrong. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's those two stops. The next one was directly kind of west, northwest uh, towards St. Helena Island. And the problem with that now, that prevailing south wind that I talked about, it was howling, I think 35 knots. And now picture us going kind of beam to that, to that um, weather. Plus there was a big, you saw this on the Predict Wind yeah. site. If any of you watched it, kind of watched us live go across the ocean, there was a huge storm down there that Janice was like, I hope you're not going to get hit by this storm. We didn't get hit by the storm, but the swells that came out of that storm were, were hitting us. And then the wind would come from a slightly different angle. So the swells from the storm would come at us from kind of like in front of our beam, but the wind was coming from our back quarter. So we had these really confused seas where one waves are hitting us one direction and other waves are hitting us another direction. And the boat turned into this weird left, right, front, back, left, right, front, back, violently. Uh, even these avid sailors I was with said that the oceans are what's called very confused and very uncomfortable. And that's where I had my first real taste of seasickness. I didn't even know I was susceptible. I didn't bring any seasick medication. I never was seasick on my first transatlantic passage back at the end of uh, 2017. 
So didn't even think it was an issue, but wow. Anybody who says, oh, I get seasick, so I couldn't do this, I, I, I feel your pain because uh, I get it. now I realize what it feels like. And it's not like being car sick. If you've ever been in a car and you're trying to read something and the person's stopping and starting and you feel a little nauseous, but then you put the book down or you put whatever, and then you feel better almost instantly, that's not the way seasickness works. So I'm on watch my turn and it's a night watch, 6 to 9 p.m. And since it's winter, it was dark pretty much my whole night watch. And I started feeling really not great prior to that, but as long as you can see the horizon during daytime hours and you get the fresh wind in your face, you're, you're, I was okay. But as soon as the sun went down, I couldn't see the horizon and I'm looking at the instruments on my helm and you have to go inside to the nav station to do your hourly log entry. So we had a book, we had to write all our latitude, longitude, our speed, our wind direction. And um, while I was trying to write that, it was like Muhammad Ali punched me in the gut like five times in a row. I just felt instantly like I had to run for By the rail. Myself. And um, so I ran with the rail. It wasn't pretty. Um, and then another coworker kind of helped me out for the last hour of my shift because I literally couldn't not feel like I was gonna throw up. So that was day one of my seasickness. Day two, how was I then? I felt rough. Uh, I, I spent a lot of my downtime just laying in my bunk and trying to make that feeling go away. By day three, I was feeling okay. I was walking around, of course I was doing my watches uh, but anything that smelled strong, like if they cooked with garlic or onions or whatever, it kind of made me a little nauseous again. I certainly couldn't eat anything that had any sort of spices in it uh, because my stomach felt like it was in knots. So third day I was I was moving around and doing stuff, but it still felt a little wah. But after that, so I guess by four, day four, I was fine. And for the rest of the voyage for the next X number of weeks, no matter how bad the seas were, I never felt seasick. So if there's anything you learn from this, and I learned from this, is just fight through it because even if you think you don't get seasick, if you have the right conditions, you can. And it doesn't just go away the minute you, you know, get fresh air and look at the horizon. It takes longer than that. So yeah, I had it one time. Was yeah. it last, last year? Well, you had it a bit on the BVI when we chartered. Oh, yeah, that. But uh, the one time on, on our own boat, our own crossing boat. Lake Ontario there, I could not shake that off and I threw up a lot. Yeah, she didn't admit it to me. She was down there forever. I'm like, what are you doing I down there? Down and I, I, I took out, like I took everything off because like even my like I was worried like the pants were tight, so I took everything off. And there was a big bowl. And, and I'm I look in and she's laying on the floor. Oh, yeah. and I go, you okay? She's like, oh, I'm good. A giant mixing bowl. Yeah. So she's had it. I've I've really really had it, and uh, it really knocked me. Uh, it felt like I got the crap kicked out of me. So that was uh, on the way to. St. Helena. So how was St. Helena? Uh, St. Helena was a must stop. That was one of those places. It's so beautiful. It's so remote. So you'd be one of these people that can tell your sailing friends you went to St. Helena because it's almost directly in the middle of the South Atlantic. Um, so very, very few sailors have ever gotten down there. And it is so picturesque. It's so diverse too, because it's a volcanic island. It uh, is completely like from the sea, it looks like just sheer cliffs and rocks. So you're like, how do we get on this island? You find one little area where they have their town entrance that's low, uh, it's like a valley that's low to the water. And that's how, that's the only spot you can really get on the island. Um, they don't have any docks uh, for your dinghy. That was the only thing. But anyways, let's get back to the island. Um, the good things, the island is so diverse that even driving, we picked Rudolph up because we had some problems with our water maker and some other tweaky issues. So Exquisite actually flew Rudolph, the lead designer to St. Helena. And there's one flight a week that flies in from Johannesburg and him and his wife decided to go because once he came to work on our boat he was stuck there for a week until he could get the flight back so that's a major commitment for the lead designer of a company to come and work on your boat and they were mostly working on the water maker which isn't even something exquisite built that's built by Spectra um, so they could have just gone well you have a problem with your water maker we'll call Spectra but no they're really really interested in making sure that their after sale service is great and that so they flew a guy out, not a lowly level employee too, the lead designer to, to work on our boat. So he flew out, we had to pick him up at the airport. So we took a cab and you're leaving this valley, this lush green valley, you go over these, through these windy roads of this mountain. And then you get on the other side towards the airport and it's like a desert. There's like cactuses and it's really weird. Then you come around this other way. We ended up doing another uh, tour with like this 85 year old guy who has his own tour company and we did a whole island tour and he talked about everything and he's talking about experiencing it like he remembers world war ii when some german submarines sunk some boats in the harbor and he heard the explosions and he, the whole town ran down and saw the boats on fire and sinking and 
he lived it. It's not like he's talking about he heard it happen. He actually remembers seeing it. So a uh, great experience getting him. His name's Robert from History on Wheels was the company. And we took this tour of the island and he showed us everything where Napoleon lived when he was exiled to the island and just a bunch of other stuff. So very, very cool. Um, very diverse from lush jungle to like almost cedar forests in a different part to desert in another part. Um, we saw massive tortoises that are uh, at the governor's house that are like a hundred and pff, crazy number of years old, which of course I filmed all of this. So you'll see this all in the episodes. So St. Helena, definitely a must see. The only downside, well, actually there's kind of two downsides. There's no dinghy docks. There's no way to get to shore except for a water taxi. So you anchor, uh, you, you pay for a mooring ball. Um, and then you, when you want to go to shore, you've got to call on the VHF to say, can somebody pick me up? And they pretty much only send out the water taxi once an hour. So they'll wait till a bunch of people need to be picked up. Then they'll go around, pick up everybody and take you to shore where there's like the cement wall with these like Tarzan swinging ropes. Now, if you've ever watched Delos, oh, they yeah. stopped there. And um, so what they did with theirs was they brought the dinghy right up to this wall and they did the Tarzan swing to the cement pier. Um, and then um, I think Brian ended up taking the dinghy out and anchoring his dinghy and swimming to shore so they could avoid the whole water taxi thing. Um, we were doing this in winter. So remember, it's still quite chilly, especially at night. So none of us really wanted to be the guy that has to swim to shore from a dinghy. Uh, so we ended up doing the water taxi all the time. The downside is it, it's like banking hours almost, like they're open from whatever, eight in the morning until 6 p.m. at night. So if you wanna go to the bars or do anything fun after 6 p.m., you're out of luck because you're not gonna get back to your boat unless you find some other uh, person who has some way to get you to your boat. So that was kind of problem A is you're paying, you don't pay right away, but at the end of your time when you're about to leave, you're supposed to pay the ferry, the uh, water taxi people X number of dollars per trip that they've taken a person. So it's on the honor system because I never saw any of these guys, A, take money from other locals who got picked up. So I don't know if the locals get it for free, but if you're a tourist, they expect you to pay the water taxi guy. And I guess at the end, they just said, how many times have you come back and forth and how many people have you brought? And then you pay them based on that. So there is a fee, it's not free, um, but you don't have a choice. And the, actually, the other thing that I found really bizarre the town is so beautiful and I expected on this remote island it to be like electric golf carts, but no, everybody had a car, like a real car and not old like 1950s cars that are rusted out, real nice cars. So I was, I was like amazed by that. But you, so you see all these clean town with lots of friendly people and real cars driving around. You think they're modern and then you try and pay for anything like food at a restaurant, groceries at a grocery store. They don't take anything but cash and they have their own St. Helena money. So the only way to pay for anything was to go to the bank and take money out of your personal account at which they add a fee on top of it to get St. Helena dollars, which are, I guess are pegged to the British pound because it's a British kind of island. But then when you're done, if you overestimate how much you need, you have all the St. Helena money, which then if you try and change back into US dollars or some other thing, you pay a huge premium again. So kind of inconvenient to not be able to use a credit card, but it's just the way this island was. And part of it was they have almost no internet connection you could buy uh, internet 30 yeah. minutes at a time, but the guys who bought it said the internet was so slow, you could barely even read your emails, let alone try and upload photos or videos like I was hoping to do. Mm. Yeah, we so, didn't do any FaceTime. No, no FaceTime. And the only update you guys saw was the one I did in Namibia where the Yacht Club had really quite, quite decent internet, but um, St. Helena, no go. Couldn't, couldn't upload anything, not even photos really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so no internet there, but an island well worth visiting. Bring cash, bring lots of US. If you already had US money in your hand, you probably could get vendors or, or stores, restaurants to take US money. But if you have to go to the bank, you're gonna pay a fee on top of your exchange. So there you go. Any other so questions? Roger K. Davis <coughs> is asking how many episodes will it take to cover oh, the past? Good question, good, good question. Plan. I don't know because there was so much that I don't want this to turn into, well, the problem is I have a time crunch because in October, we're going again to the Annapolis Sailboat Show. Um, I have a bunch of new shirts made. This one actually has a saying on it down here. Life's too short, go explore. I have other ones that say uh, living life one anchorage at a time. Um, that new uh, Teespree store I set up is there. I've got a bunch of those shirts. I ordered a ton of them, hoping to get them before I leave on this trip because I was planning to give one to every crew member uh, and maybe one to Tomas okay. and people that are that were uh, you know uh, a big part of this trip. 
but I didn't get them in time. It came like two days after. Yeah, that. after I left, they showed up. So anyways, I got a bunch of these shirts. So when I'm at the Annapolis Film Books, yeah. uh, I'll bring some. And what I plan to do is every day, any viewer that says hi to us, the first one will get a chance to get one of the shirts that we'll give away. Until we run out of shirts. Yeah, we, and I want to give at least one to a, uh, a Patreon uh, member. So I'll hold back at least one shirt to anybody who comes up and introduces himself that's a patron. So I'll bring a bunch of shirts in a backpack and I'll give you a choice of whatever we have until we run mm -hmm. out. So yeah, if you're coming to the Annapolis Sailboat Show, we will be there. So that's where the time crunch comes with these episodes is once that starts, those episodes are like time sensitive. People want to know what's going on at the Annapolis show. So my hope is to get all these uh, South Atlantic Sailing Voyage episodes done and uploaded before the uh, Annapolis Sailboat show. Ignoring their, their loudspeaker. Yeah, ignoring a doorbell that's happening right now. Um, so that's my time crunch. So I'm kind of having to look at my footage and go, how much time do I have to edit these episodes before I go to the Annapolis Sailboat show? And therefore, I might have to cut back on stuff that maybe originally I would think I was going to publish that I won't because I'll run out of time. So I'm going to have to go through all the footage and go, what's absolutely must produce and what's just kind of uh, nice to have or fluff or whatever. Now, another thing when I filmed it, this is kind of a side issue. I told you guys what I wanted to do was kind of like a vlog of how things are every day. It didn't work out that way because where I sat on Helm and my last voyage, that's where I did a lot of my vlogging. When I was alone, you don't want to do a vlog like with like people working around you. So you often want to have a little bit of privacy um, in case you make a fool of yourself. So I thought I'd sit at the helm, and when I was on watch by myself, I would tell you what went on in the day or whatever happened. Unfortunately, the way this boat, boat was set up, somebody was always sleeping in the salon, outdoor salon, right behind the helm. Oh. So while you're on watch, there's always somebody sleeping behind you, whether they're napping in the middle of the day or sleeping in the middle of the night. So you couldn't just turn on a camera and go, hey, welcome back to cruising off duty. Let me tell you what happened today because the guy behind you would be like, shut the hell up, right? So, so it kind of made it difficult. Um, and then Sean, the owner, loved to blare music. He had outdoor stereos, so he was always blaring music. And I know how copyright infringement works with YouTube. If you start recording and there's an actual radio worthy song on the radio and YouTube hears it, you'll get a co uh, copyright infringement Thing against you and you'll probably lose any monetization to that uh, to that episode so it made it really really challenge for me to just whip out the camera and do you know thought of the day stuff so most of my footage then was more like me behind the camera filming things that we're seeing you know dolphins swimming in the bow uh, all these places we stopped um less of it was that daily vlog type style so just be advised of that yeah, so Jaren was just asking, will you be spending the rest of the summer sailing around your place? Um, around Thousand Islands and back and forth to the States. Mm -hmm. Likely to Clayton. Uh, they're having high water again, so some of the towns won't have a, have docks. Again? So, still high? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So Clayton, I know, is open, so we'll go at least go there Yeah. and stock up on We're thinking of going to Rochester, too, weren't we? Yeah. We're trying to cross. We're kind of running out of summer because I yeah. just got back last night. After yeah, we only have a week and a half vacation left. Yeah. Might only spend a week on the boat. Um, yeah, so we're running out of time. So we're going to definitely sail. That's what our plans of are until summer's over. But uh, right now we pretty much plopped the boat and then he left. So we don't have the Bimini Dodger or Jib up, yeah. and it badly needs a, a wash. Yeah. I have some work to do. We have some friends in Kingston who just says nice things for us. To, they they go by and check on our boat, and we got a Facebook message saying, "Hey, I checked uh, David checked our boat. He goes, your boat looks great. It's still above water, but man, is it dirty." Yeah. So all the mayflies, like they, yeah. there's a lot of bugs in the spring, so yeah. it is covered in bugs. Yeah. And uh, Ford um, McEwen, where, where will we bo be boating this weekend? Probably the Thousand Islands or crossing the Clayton? Yeah, well, since we don't have our all our sails or Bimini Dodger up, but a lot of it's going to be like go around the corner to yeah. Navy Bay. Yeah, we'll motor to Navy Bay and spend a day or two there. And like first we'll pressure wash before we leave, and then yeah. we'll motor to Navy Bay with the Bimini Dodger. Navy Bay is the warmest water because it's, it's, it's like a backyard swimming pool for yeah. us. So we can swim. Yeah. And then where, while we're there, we'll put up our Dodger Bimini and we'll put up our Genoa and we'll get the boat mm -hmm. properly sailable. And then we're on vacation. So as soon as that's done and the boat's ready, we may. We want to go to the States. And get yeah, those. go to the States and get some more booze. Get some, um, get some is it thousand. Yeah, Cape, Clayton is the closest town Probably with like a liquor store right on the yeah. harbor. We'll definitely hit that spot. It's yeah. also the one town that's built high enough that even when there's high water, they still have docks. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other towns are like so low yeah. that the minute there's high water, the docks are underwater and yeah. you can't so stop not. there. So, uh, and Rochester oh. was one we tried to go to last year, but ran out of time. So yeah. we're gonna try and go to, that's across Lake Ontario. Um, so that's a bigger, bigger excursion. So, 
All right, so can I get back to my, uh, um, or is there a must questions? James Winter, what were your watch hours? So we did, there was four of us on the boat. Uh, we didn't share watches, you each had your own watch. Um, mine was 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, who came on after me? Sean, the owner, was uh, 9 to min uh, noon and 9 p.m. to midnight. And then after that was Steve, who then got replaced by uh, Valentin in uh, Brazil. And he did the midnight to 3 a.m. And then Neil did the 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, and vice versa, p.m. And then I and then it rotates again. And I'm back on my 6 a.m. So I had the, probably the best uh for sleep habits, I had the best 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So I was lucky. I think once I got really seasick uh, on that one uh, over, like when I started getting nothing but night shifts, um, I think they were afraid to put me on all night shifts. <laughs> so I, I kind of got the best shift after yeah. that. They never switched me. Yeah, like so. what, sunrise shifting? Sunrise. Well, the problem is wintertime, it's like if you're from Canada, you know the same thing. In winter, the sun goes down really quick and the sun gets rises really late. So uh, when we first left Cape Town, my, my day shift and my night shift were mostly – in dark anyway um so because the sun wasn't up till 9 p.m for sure it was it was down before i even started my 6 p.m shift and the same thing in the morning the sun wouldn't rise until like 7 38 in the morning so my first hour and a half was in the dark so a lot of it was dark anyway but for sleep habits it was more uh, not as hard to get up for can i go on to my next stop where we got something how did the provisioning work out and how was the food okay. asks maureen tweedley okay this is something i was going to talk about after the um after the uh, different stops, but let's just mention it now. Um, I wasn't in charge of provisioning, let's just say that. I was, remember I mentioned that Clinton, Clinton put me in a hotel so I could focus on editing because the, the boat was being worked on while we were stuck for 10 days. The exquisite people and Phoenix people were doing little tweaks and stuff. So there's always working crews on the boat and we were trying to, four of us were trying to live on the boat. So it was just constant pandemonium. So I didn't have anywhere to sit and edit with a piece of quiet plus no internet. So I went off to the hotel for two or three days and for the 10 days or 11 days or 12 days that the boat was there, there was no provisioning. The boat had like beer and coffee and chips. Like there was like, it was like it was run by high school ch kids. That, that's how it was. Um, so there's no food to eat. So we had to eat restaurant food every day, which I couldn't really afford. So I was eating cheap, like food court food while the other guys were eating like fancy food. So I was often separated from them. Um, when we finally did get provisioned, I wasn't there. And the two other crew members did all the provisioning. Um, surprisingly, Sean, who paid for it all, wasn't there when they bought stuff. And so it was like, again, like high school students were provisioning the boat. Because I got on the boat and it was every meal was meat, carb, and cheese. So it would be meat with some sort of cheese drizzled over it with rice or maybe potatoes if we had potatoes. Uh, with more cheese drizzled all over it, and uh, lots of beer. and lots of beer. And I'm not a big beer drinker. Um, in fact, when I first got on the boat, I was like, "Hey!" In the morning, I'm like, "Hey, do we have any juice?" And they were like, "No." I go, well, "What? What do we have to drink?" And they go, "Well, there's beer, and there's water." And I'm like, "That's the only two things we have to drink." <laughs> I was like, "Are you kidding me?" So um, yeah, by Namibia, because of that, they reprovisioned again, and they got like things that I could drink, like juice and. Um, yeah, I drink beer as a social thing. If somebody's drinking a beer, I'll have one just mm -hmm. to be sociable. But my drink of choice was uh, is actually rum. rum. Um, I like, and they I didn't. Like, I don't like beer at all. It's a way more. And the owner was uh, let the other two guys provision, and they didn't buy any rum. Uh, they just bought beer, lots and lots and lots and lots of beer. So provisioning was a little bit for me trying to be a vegetarian slash flexitarian where I eat mostly vegetables, except for if Janice cooks something with meat, it smells good. I will eat it. I don't have any like religious or any other reasons to cut out meat. It's just a health thing. So I was like culture shocked or, or digestively shocked by the fact there was no vegetables on the boat pretty much. And I was eating nothing but meat and carb you know, and junk food, chips and chocolate and other things were on the boat. So a lot of times when you're hungry, you just try to grab something that was easy. And the boat was like like uh, a high school frat house or a university frat house. So Brian from Florida and David H. Uh, want to know, after sailing and working with Exquisite, did you plant the seed that you'll need one for the channel? Oh, God. Yeah, I did definitely <laughs> try to say, like, I love your boat. I love your boat. I can't stress that enough. You die in there. <gasps> Hurts to God. So... For so, those that may not have seen the Facebook, I had a car accident two and a half weeks ago. I broke my hand and I have a fractured sternum, but that only hurts when I cough and sneeze. So a little pass out on me. Coughing sucks. Um, 
So yeah, I, I told them, I told Clinton, the owner, and, and Tomas, I'm sure has heard from me. I love their boats. Unfortunately, just so you know, I mentioned this before, mm -hmm. their boats are $1.3 million US. Um, they've come pretty fully kitted out to live aboard right from the factory. Mm -hmm. But if you add any, like Sean added a, a, a extension on the roof to give more room for uh, solar. And there was a few other things that he wanted done to the boat. So his price is even higher than that. So I, we can't afford that. We're working class people. So um, the, the other three crew members are all business owners and they have way, 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 way bigger budgets for boats than, than we do. But I did say, hey, if you know we can afford to pay what we can afford to pay, would you be willing to like, uh, you know, lease us a boat or, or whatever? And I can be a, we can be a brand ambassador. So I did throw that out there and they said, that's interesting. We'll consider it. So yeah. we'll see. But in all likelihood, we can't afford that boat anyway. So we'll probably get a used um, something else. There's a few boats we like, but that probably, because it's out of our price range, uh, isn't going to be our boat. But it is a beautiful boat, and if anybody has that kind of money to spend, I highly suggest it because as much as $1.3 million seems like a lot of money, if you got a 50-foot lagoon or a 50-foot leopard and then kitted it out with everything this boat has, be you'd be probably spending about the same amount of money, and you're going to get a much, much better quality boat with the Exquisite than you are if you buy a lagoon or a leopard or a Fontaine Peugeot. So... Keep that in mind. Uh, definitely check it out if you can afford it. So that's that. Any other things? I still have more stops. Are we good? Continue. We continue. To? Okay. So after St. Helena, we did. So it was about 12 days from Namibia to St. Helena. St. Helena was awesome. Then the next stop was supposed to be Ascension Island, where all of us, it was the only place that we needed to get an e-visa. Uh, because I found out the reason that even though it's British, it was the only place that required an e-visa is because there's a big military base on Ascension Island. So we all paid to have an e-visa done and then we didn't even go there <laughs> because Steve, who was our most experienced sailor, uh, he lived, him and his wife lived for seven years or five years full time on a catamaran. So he, he knows catamarans inside out and backwards. So he was our most experienced uh, sailor. He ran out of time because of this whole delay at the beginning. So he got to St. Helena and he said, here's the choice. I either get off and fly home now or we race to Brazil and I fly home from there. So we skipped Ascension Island and we went to an island called Fernando de Norona in Brazil. So it's off the coast, kind of the north end of Brazil, sort of, on the way, on, kind of on a direct path to uh, the Caribbean. So we didn't check out Ascension. I don't think it was a huge loss. A lot of people, when they found out we were going there, said it's kind of a, like a rock in the middle of the ocean. There's not a lot of lush vegetation and stuff. So maybe we didn't miss too much not going to Ascension, but it was kind of a... Uh, Disappointing that we all went to the trouble of getting an e-visa uh, and going through all that rigmarole and then uh, not using it. So so Brazil was the next stop. Fernando de Nerona. Now, I've never been to Brazil, so that was uh, um, interesting. <laughs> it was a really nice island. The thing with Brazil is they're very proud of their uh, culture and they don't teach their kids English. Um, so their Portuguese is their language. And everywhere you went, it was really tough to find anybody that spoke English, including taxi drivers or anything. They didn't understand even basic, you know, like if you say, can we, we're trying to find a grocery store or a, uh, you know, something like that. They didn't understand what you were saying. So Steve, who's from California, knew Spanish a bit. I mean, he's not fluent, but he knew enough that a lot of times when you use the Spanish words for what you're asking for, they, they understood that. And I guess it's because Brazil is surrounded by a bunch of Spanish speaking countries. So they have kind of learned a little bit of Spanish, but thank not you, really. Gave us 20 bucks. Oh, thank you very much, Jer. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I will definitely send that money. <laughs> um, so long and short, it was a bit hard to get around on this island, except for places that were clearly tourist spots. Like near the harbor, there were some restaurants that overlooked the harbor that when we went there, the, the waiters and waitresses uh, new English and that's great but that's because it's very touristy as soon as you went off kind of the beaten path a little bit um, expect that you're gonna have uh, problems unless you can speak Spanish well for some reason they kind of understood Spanish. Spanish I kind of know well, French yeah. I'm fluent enough in French uh, that I can fully comprehend and yeah and so, Spanish is similar I, I find that I do understand a lot of it yeah she'll be better so I intend to learn that before we leave yeah so, um, Sean's from the US North Carolina he didn't, he didn't know any Spanish. Uh, Neil's from uh, England, or he's from Scotland originally, or somewhere. It's, anyways, he's from Britain. So he didn't know any Spanish. And I'm from Canada, where we never hear Spanish. So none of us knew Spanish. Thank God Steve was there. Because um, a lot of times, like I said, as soon as you got a little bit off the, the harbor, even the police 
it's funny. We got off the boat and we saw a police officer there, a motorcycle police officer standing guard by there. There's kind of a, a, a festival going on. And we walked up to say, hey, you know, uh, customs, uh, immigration, because we got off the boat. We're thinking we got to check in. Right. And the police officer just walked away from us. Like we were like, oh, OK. Like, I guess because we were trying to ask him a question in English or broken Spanish, he just like decided, nope. Not speaking Portuguese, I'm not talking to you, and he just literally walked away. So we were like, okay, I guess we'll try and ask someone else. So we, you know, asked around and asked around and found out that customs and immigration was not anywhere near where this harbor is. Um, so it was a bit of a rigmarole to get in there. Now, the island is beautiful. It is like a tourist island for Brazilians, rich Brazilians, because everything on this island was super expensive, including your uh, anchoring or mooring fees. It worked out because Fernando de Nerona is a uh, nature reserve island. It's like their version of the Galapagos Islands. So what happens is you get there and you don't, we didn't realize this, you get there and they charge you an anchoring fee per day for the boat, which was quite expensive, uh, per day too, not a one-time fee, and then a per person on your boat fee. And when we added it all up, it worked out to be 200 US dollars per day, which you go, is that up to a maximum of amount? As far as we could tell, no. So we stayed there for three days and it cost um, like, I, I, maybe it was four days. I'm not sure. It cost quite a bit of money. Thank you, Ryan Zone. He just, oh, thank you. 10 bucks. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's really helps. Thanks a lot. Um, so what happens is we get, we don't really know the price until we go to check out and then they're like, jing, 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 adding all these fees on. And Sean's sitting there going, holy crap, we've only been here three days. So, if you're going to go there, it's well worth it. Oh, um, Roger C68. Oh, Roger, you've been around forever. <laughs> Thanks, guy. He used to be a, so uh, uh, he's a patron as well. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you, Roger. Um, what ends up happening is you get the bill at the end, and they socked us. So if you're going to go and you want to experience this island, highly suggest it. There's lots to do. It's, it's oh, talking about eco, they're not lying about the eco. While we're anchored there, there's literally hundreds of dolphins just swimming around our boat, turtles. Uh, there's tons of scuba excursion shops to take you to wrecks and all this water, uh, wildlife and stuff. It was amazing. So it is worth going, but have an agenda. Get there, anchor, and do everything you can in like three days and then leave. Because if you plan to be there weeks or months, good luck. You know, you better have some deep pockets. So Fernando de Nerona, I would, if anybody said, would you stop there again with Janice? Yes, I would. For the tea. But yeah, you hit the beach. It's like you're on a, you know, marine you know, a military exercise, you're hitting the beach the minute you get there, you you go to the local, uh, you know, excursion people, you say, I want to go scuba diving, or I want to go here, let's do this, bang, bang, bang. And every day, you better have something planned, because you don't want to just hang out on your boat watching the sunset, it was going to cost you 200 bucks a day. So there you go. Yeah. So that was Fernando de Nerona. Any questions before we go to the last place? Um, Nigel Pryor says, ha ha, you've now met Neil and Sean, who have no idea about food, and no way would I have let them <laughs> Thanks for the heads up, bud. <laughs> I won't even blame Sean. It was actually Steve, the other crew member, and Neil that did the provisioning. Uh, Sean kind of left it up to them, which in hindsight, I'm sure even he was like, the one question. Was I not in charge? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you guys do it. And then we saw what they bought. He was like, holy crap. Um, there's going to be a, a, an episode where Tomas, who took the first route with us, does a full boat tour while we're sailing, which is quite cool. And at one point, he opens the fridge to like, present the fridge and he's like yes and you have a fridge freezer and he opens it all you can see is cheese just like every every um like shelf was just jammed like to the rafters with cheese and even sean and i were like who eats this much cheese like it's insane so <laughs> i guess neil was a huge fan of cheese so we have all sorts and a lot of it was that stinky cheese oh. like the the really like old cheese that like literally looks like it has mold on it and it stunk so you open up the fridge and it was like, you hit in the face with the scents of all these cheeses so it was interesting. But if we were provisioning, if Janice and I were provisioning, we were way more we're similar, I mean, vegetarian. And she likes more meat more than I do. I do yeah. So we would have meat, of course. And we, oh, we do catch a fish. We catch a massive 38 pound mahi mahi on this thing. And we, uh, we you know, of course, made full use of it. And uh, Sean has a lot of little toys on this boat. He had a bread maker, mm -hmm. which I, I highly yeah, suggest. You need a bread maker on a boat like this because when you go to these local markets, it's like a homemade bread, no preservatives in it, of course. And the, on this hot, hot climate, the bread went moldy in like two days. So it was like almost, unless you stuck it in the fridge or freezer, the bread goes moldy and it's expensive. So get a bread maker. He had an air fryer to cook like French fries or, or, any, or even make toast. That was kind of neat. And he had one of those, um, like we have a Cuisinart 
press thing to, to cook anything, like if you wanted to make a grilled cheese or something. So this is pretty much what we ate off of most of the time because we were acting like college frat people and eating cheese and, and, and macaroni and crazy stuff. So um, there was a barbecue on the back too, which we cooked uh, sometimes, but a lot of times we just used the oven because we wanted to put cheese on everything. So that was that. And then the last stop, should I just go with the last stop before we go questions? The last stop was Grenada. So Steve got off in Fernando de Nerona and then we got a, uh, because we're losing our most experienced crew, uh, Neil was like, we really should have somebody who really, really knows their stuff. So we talked to Exquisite and Tomas said, well, we have a delivery captain guy that you can uh, pay per day to come and he'll fly there and he'll take you the last bit. So we brought on a guy named Valentin and, um, and uh, he was really uh, knowledgeable. This guy has done, I think, 280,000 miles of sailing, of delivering boats. So he knew, he was great. I enjoyed uh, yeah. telling stories. Eric Prescott. Oh, thanks, Eric. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, Thank you so really much, appreciate Eric. it because, like I say, these uh, this was a big uh, time time waster. I had to take time off work for this, but it's well worth it. And you guys supporting the channel makes it uh, makes it easier for me to keep producing these types of things. Um, Valentin comes on. Steve is a character. I like Steve. I learned a lot from Steve because he traveled the world with his wife on a boat. I asked him so much about. He was always in the. Uh, Pacific, so he did all the Polynesian islands, and I think he went to Hawaii and other these places. And I wanted, we want to do that too. So I asked him a lot of stuff, and I learned a lot from him. So he left, and he was a character. I'm kind of glad he left when he did because we were about to cross the equator, and then he got off at Fernando, which was just south of the equator. And then we, this Valentin came on, who was very straight laced, very knowledgeable, but very straight laced. And we said, hey, by the way, you're the one that's going to initiate us when we cross the equator to make us go from polywogs to shellbacks. And he's like. Okay, well, we drink some rum, we throw, pour some booze in the ocean to Neptune, and we shears each other, and that's it. And I'm like, okay, we're getting off easy. Steve would have made it worse. Steve would have made it, hazed us bad. It would have been like naked, run around the boat, drink some crazy concoction. Who knows what he would have done. Um, so I told him, I said, it's got to be PG enough that I can actually put it on YouTube, right? Remember that. But he was laughing. At, he was going to haze us bad. So Valentin being kind of a serious captain uh, was way, way less uh, – hard on us, let's just say. So so when Valentine was on the boat, we did the equator crossing. Earlier in the passage, we did the prime meridian crossing, which is when you go to zero longitude, zero, well, zero la longitude, we're crossing the uh, prime meridian. So not as big a deal but to most people, but then we crossed the equator with uh, Valentin. So those are two kind of milestones we did. And then we stopped in Grenada. Now my original plan was to go further, but because of the 10 or 12 days at extra at the beginning that we weren't sailing, and all these service stops that were, I thought were going to be a two-day stop, ended up being like a four-day stop. Um, we kind of ran out of time. So when I got to Grenada, I crossed off the bucket list of crossing the equator. I got to the Caribbean, which I said I would definitely do. Um, so at that point, I flew home. And I got I flew home last night, and I got home after midnight. So first opportunity, I wanted to do this live episode because I felt bad that I told you I was going to be posting on Facebook and and maybe doing update videos at each stop be because I assumed there would be uh, internet when we got to these islands. I thought, oh, we'll go to some bar and we'll find uh, internet. Wasn't the case anywhere except for uh, Namibia, Saint Helena, no internet. Um, Fernando de Nerona, every restaurant we went to, no internet. Um, just it's really hard. So I mean, had it been just Janice and I on our boat, we probably would have researched. Is there a cyber cafe on this island or is there something that we could upload a video or whatever? But when I'm with a bunch of crew members, you kind of got to go with the flow. And when we got off with these guys, their main thing was let's go find a tavern or let's go find a restaurant and have some fine food and have some rounds of drinks. And, the, you know, if it has Wi-Fi, great. If it doesn't, they didn't care. Like they didn't even ask when we get to restaurants, is there Wi-Fi here? We'd go in and sit down and start eating and then say, do you have Wi-Fi? And the answer was always no. So it was tough. Oh, and the other thing too, there's an Iridium um, satellite modem on the boat. And I know for a fact, because I did this on the first uh, transatlantic, that there is a way to set up this modem that you have an account. Each person on the boat has an account, which links to your Facebook. And you can upload, like, kind of grainy, but you can kind of tweak the settings to make it less grainy, uh, photos right to your Facebook account. And when we left Cape Town, I said to Sean, so how do we, we got this set up, and he didn't know anything about it. He hadn't taken the time to... I guess, learn it. Um, that is an option, but you need to go into the settings and you have to give everybody an account and you have to link their Facebook. And that has to be done by the person that has the account. Um, so we're freezing up, he says. We're freezing up. Oh, no. Um, 
I'm gonna move and see if I yeah, we're see moving over here. We have another screen over here where we're going we're from. Like, yeah, we yeah. have some so quality we're, control. On we're, that side. we're still moving on this screen, so we're good. Um, the the uh, radio modem was set to kind of its basic default, which is you can email a person or text a person, and you can send about a 140 character message to them, and they can send about a 140 character message back. Yeah. So I could keep up with Janice, like how's she'd ask how sailing was, and I'd give her something short. If the person sent longer than 140 characters, yeah. it cuts it off. It doesn't break it into two or three messages. So I had kept having to tell her, you know, I missed the last part of your message because she would start talking, and then halfway through a sentence, it would just end. And I wouldn't know what the rest of her story was. So I'd have to send back, um, didn't catch the tail end, and then she'd have to send it again. So it was very, very basic, but at least she was able to yeah. know where, where I was and what I was up to. Mm. And that Predict Wind website that I, we clicked in the app and stuff, you could see where we were as we moved across the ocean. Um, I do know that a couple of days it went offline and we weren't even aware of it, where we just stopped moving. Or while it was offline, we also showed up back in Africa. So I know if anybody saw that, that was confusing that we weren't where we should have been. So, uh, yeah. So that was a little bit of a hardship. Um, not no internet everywhere. Uh, the boat wasn't really set up to properly upload Facebook photos or Facebook updates, which I was kind of hoping was going to be set up. Cause I know that is an option. So I'm sorry to all you viewers where I promised you one level of update and it never, never happened. It was sort of out of my control. Um, another thing kind of just off the side, I, you see Delos, Delos is kind of like everybody aspires to be kind of like Delos, where it's kind of a shared filming thing where everybody's on board with being on camera and everybody takes their turn filming so that everybody gets to be in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, Sean, who's the owner of the boat, invited me. He was cooperative with uh, helping me get footage from his various cameras. He had a, a mast mounted camera, which is very cool, uh, which we got great footage on. He had a Verb camera, which is from Garmin that actually puts on the screen you know, the wind speed and the boat speed and all this other stuff, which is kind of very cool. So he was giving me that footage, so that was assisting. But um, the downside to having two other crew members that were just there to sail is they had no interest in helping film, <laughs> which unfortunately, so a lot of times I realized right from the get-go that when I first turned the camera on, uh, Steve warmed up to it, uh, Neil less so, but Steve warmed up to the camera. But at first, when I first got on the boat, they'd be talking and laughing and we'd be having a great time and I would pull out my camera and start filming and dead air, just crickets. Like nobody wanted to talk when the camera was on. So it was like, oh, okay, this is going to be awkward because I'm the only one who talks on camera. So um, yeah, was kind of not what I was expecting. Um, Sean, of course, was, was like promoting me filming stuff, but the other two at first preferred I didn't. <laughs> so if I was ever to do this again, the two things I would change is I would Bring not. Yeah, that's number one. If anybody said, hey, would you like to do a passage with me? Probably wouldn't do eight weeks again because that was a pain in the butt to get the time off work. Uh, I had to ask for a leave of absence. And so that's too long. Uh, but if somebody said, hey, we have a two week or three week passage, would you want to join us? I would definitely do it again on the assumption that they need two crew members and Janice could come with me. Um, that way when well, A, I don't get homesick, and B, when we get to an island or a stop, if the other people on the boat go, we want to go to a tavern and drink all afternoon, Janice and I can go, oh, well, that's great. Well, we'll meet you. How about we meet yeah. you at six? We're going to backpack and go walk around, bring some snack food, and go hike through the trails and go see some lookout or whatever. That's what I wanted to do. And the other guys wanted to go to restaurants and and and, and eat fine food and, and drink, uh, which really wasn't my thing. So I, sometimes I just, because you have to come in on a dinghy, you're kind of committed. You either go in with the group and do what they want to do, or you stay on the boat. So a lot of times I just stayed on the boat because I knew that they were going to go to a bar or whatever. And, and sometimes it went on for like 12 hours. Like they'd leave at one in the afternoon and wouldn't come back till one in the morning. And so I was like, kind of like, well, that's not really, really my thing. So if Janice had been there, we would have done our own thing and just said, tell us what time you want to meet back at the, at the D and we'll do our own thing. Um, so have your significant other or somebody really, a friend, come with you so you feel like you're always doubled up with somebody who has like interests. Um, B, um, what was the B? I had a B. What was, you, what was the other thing you would do differently? So I guess shorter was one thing, not eight weeks. Yeah, uh, have Janice cool. there. And uh, yeah, if I think of it, I, I thought I had something else, but anyways. Um, oh, I guess if we were doing it on our own boat. Um, provision. Be in charge of the crew. Be, be in charge. If you're not into cheesy meat, products every every um every time then uh then provision for vegetables because <laughs> it's tough once you're on the boat and you realize that's not an option so so earlier robert flint asked what was was work okay with delays well he had already booked off until 
the end of next week. So yeah, no more care. What happened was that my vacation was already I'd already put in my vacation picks, um, and it was July. And then when I got this opportunity to sail in May, mid May, I left. I had to ask for time off before what was going to be my annual leave. Um, so yeah, I had to ask for time off, uh, special time off. Uh, before my annual leave. So when I got back here last night, I'm still on vacation until the 28th. So I go back to work on the 29th. So I, there, it's no delay for work. It was asking for time off at the beginning before my vacation started. Mm -hmm. um, so for, uh, Ford McKinnon says that the Clayton poker run is this weekend. Oh, so maybe so we'll avoid Clayton. There won't be any yeah, slips. That was a big, massive. We'll go on race. Monday that and to, yeah. to Clayton. Not that we're not interested in that. It would be exciting, fun to watch. We can anchor out yeah. and watch the the, the boats. Yeah, they both race by us. It's kind of fun. Yeah, right? but trying to get a slip in, in Clayton will be. Yeah, easy, we won't, so. good to know. Thanks yeah, for telling thank us that. You. We don't want to get there and find out. Like you can't have a slip. Um, yeah. What was that? Ronzo Alonzo asked, "What was the overall camaraderie?" with everyone on the boat? Um, it was good. Like I got along with everybody, but I think, like I said, we kind of touched on this already. Um, they were much more uh, interested in, in beer drinking than I was. So it was one of these things where a lot of time, oh, and the other thing too is, it's like, I, I use an analogy of this. Let's say you get on a, a, an elevator. This was me getting on a boat for eight weeks with people I'd never met before. I was with Sean, I met a bit at the Annapolis Sailboat Show. And if you think about it, it shouldn't be surprising that you get on a boat with absolute strangers and you aren't in total simpatico. You don't have all the same interests and all the same likes. Uh, so it's one of these things like I got along with them fine. It's, you know, I, I talked a lot with with uh, Steve and, and Sean and even Valentin, the new guy that came out at the end and everything was great. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of interests weren't the same. Like, you know, I talk about movies or, or sports and, and the other guys are like, I don't watch TV or I don't watch sports. So they didn't know anything about it. Um, I'm not a big beer drinker and, and they were. So it was one of these things when their interests, when we went to shore, my interests weren't the same, uh, even on the boat. So, and also too, um, Neil and, and Steve really liked reading books. So a lot of times when I got up from my, uh, you know, mid morning nap after my shift, uh, and everybody's off in their own corner, um, Sean tended to like audio books, which I also like. Um, and Steve and Neil were reading books separately as well. So a lot of times you get up and there wasn't a lot of, Shit chat. It was a lot of everybody doing their own thing. My first transatlantic with the shards and uh, Dave and Alex and and Dan. There was a lot of interaction. There we were playing cards a lot, and when you were not on watch, everybody's sitting around the table, you know, playing cards or playing some board game or something, and it forced you to socially interact with each other as opposed to if you get up and people are reading books or whatever. And now if they if you ask them, they probably said. Man, he watched his uh, TV shows on his iPad all the time. Well, it's kind of like chicken and egg, which came first. A lot of times if you get up and everybody's doing their own thing in their own corner, well, then by default, I would just get assume that nobody's chatting, so let's I'd whip out my iPad. And I had a ton of TV shows and movies preloaded, thank God. And uh, I'd either watch that or I would listen to audiobooks. So it was, again, it's a weird thing where do we get along? Yes, but were we like chatting and hanging out and playing cards? And not, not so much. So, uh, yeah. So that's why having Janice on board would have been a different thing because we could. We like all thing. the same things. Yeah, like yeah. we prefer rum. Uh, <laughs> I do like beer. I mean, I don't like beer. He does like beer. I don't get anything well, from I, beer. I'll drink it socially. Yeah. But um, like we went for breakfast with his mom this morning, and I ordered my food, and then he ordered his food, and it was the exact same. So like we like the exact same. Yeah. So we like um, the same stuff. We, we always agree on what restaurant to go to and what to do. Yeah. You know? So we would have easily mm -hmm. gone months on the boat and 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 had tons of stuff in common. So, anyways, don't want to get it wrong. The guys were great. Uh, nothing wrong with any of them. They all and probably there's viewers out there who goes, oh, I love beer. Going to yeah, going into shore and hanging out in a tavern and drinking beers. What's wrong with you? Why wouldn't you want to do that? It's just each each to each their own, right? That's not my thing. And I would have rather just gotten a backpack and and gone exploring on the island. Um, That's like me, like I'm not like, I, I find I don't have a lot in common with most women. I don't like to just sit on the beach. I find that boring. Yeah. And, you know, so, so but I'm not a super actually talkative, talkative female compared to most females. I don't like talking on the phone. I don't get stuck on the phone for an hour with my girlfriend. So I don't, mm -hmm. that's not my thing. And, you know, yeah, we have a lot in common. Yeah. So it would have been, uh, it felt long. Eight weeks felt long and I was definitely ready to come home. Uh, I think if Janice had been on board, eight weeks might have flown by. 
and I might have been like, oh, too bad it's over. So um, it is what it is, right? It's just a, a different different strokes for different folks. So, Spencer Geller, I guess I can't even read my own writing. I'm sorry. Just go with the first name. They know who they are. <laughs> it's asking, can you talk about your impressions of the two 50 foot boats that you that you crossed on? Oh, between the Discovery 50, which is called Blue Water 50, and this one. Um, definitely this one. The, nothing wrong with the Discovery. It's more expensive, surprisingly, and it felt like it had less stuff built into it. So this boat was, like, kitted out, everything you'd ever need. Um, it's even plumbed with the uh, lines for a scuba tank compressor. So it just felt, and it's a super solid boat, really structurally solid. It has a really high bridge deck clearance. I'll have footage of me swimming underneath with a GoPro and it's completely flat and smooth on the inside. A lot of boats, when you look underneath, there's all these changs and parts from the side hulls that are sticking out, which of course get slapped by waves going underneath. Um, this boat, a lot less slamming. Um, like the waves, it does get slamming. And I mean, all catamarans will, especially when you get waves from the side. So what happens is you've got two hulls. These two hulls are sticking down. The wave comes, picks this one up, it goes under. And but this doesn't have time to go up again before the wave hits this side. So when the waves come from the side, you are gonna get slamming on the opposite hull. That's just gonna happen. It's just part of being a catamaran. Um, waves coming underneath from behind though, was less slammy than the other boat because the, I think the bridge deck clearance was pretty high. Um, the boat sails really well. I guess we never didn't get into that. The boat sails really well. Most of it we did, uh, again, this is similar to the last transatlantic. We used a spinnaker, or in this case it was a parasail, a lot when we were going downwind. Because with the parasail, we could go anywhere from about, I think almost 90 degrees to the wind on one side to all the way 90 degrees to the wind on the other side, just by taking in one line and making it your downhaul line and the other line becomes your sheet and then vice versa if the wind switches around or if you jive, you do the opposite. You take one side down and let the other side out a little bit. And it, it was an amazing sail to sail almost anything downwind. Um, and that boat, when you have that sail out, it's a light wind sail, you know, 15, especially when you're going downwind, your apparent wind looks feels less. So if you got 20 knots of wind, that you go, oh, 20 knots is plenty. But when you start going straight downwind, 20 knots is actually a 10 knot apparent, right? So it, it feels like there's hardly any wind when you're going straight downwind. So you need a light wind sail like a spinnaker. And that happened on the first transatlantic too, where we used our spinnaker like 75 or 80% of the time. Same thing on this one. But going downwind, straight downwind with this uh, parasail, we did a 196 mile day and, and a couple other days were in the high 90s, 190s as well. That's pretty uh, respectable. Now, one episode is gonna have Steve, who's that guy with super experience on a catamaran and he's buying another catamaran. He came from a performance cat um, that weighed, I think it was a shorter cat, but it weighed 14,000 pounds. This boat fully loaded with everything, water and fuel and everything is like 50, 56,000 pounds. So this is a very heavy boat. Um, but it sailed still really well. Like I said, it's, it's hulls are very smooth and it was very efficient, but it's a way heavier boat. Um, so it's very sturdy. You feel very secure in it. Uh, it sails respectably well, but it's not a performance boat. It's not going to break any water speed records. You're not going to have, you know, 280 mile days and stuff like that. Uh, now the fastest point of sail is on beam. So we did near the end at Grenada, we were on a beam reach and uh, we were, on a consistent 11 knot speed. So do the math, if we were able to keep 11 knots 24 hours a day, we would get a almost a 250 mile day. But that would be very unique that you'd be on a beam, perfect weather, perfect wind conditions to do an average of 11 knots per uh, per hour per for 24 hours. So count on a 200 mile day being a, a good day. So if you're happy with that, then you'll be happy with the performance. If you're a performance person and you're used to kicking off high 200 mile days, uh, then you might be um, underwhelmed, let's just say. And I'm, I don't care about that. And we don't care. So for a boat that we're thinking of. I want gadgets and gizmos yeah. and comfort. Steve does a whole episode with me where we talk about the features, what we liked, what we didn't like of the boat. He loved this boat, but he says because he's a performance guy, it probably didn't match all of, take all of his boxes. But he said anybody who wants comfort. Yeah. Uh, and with a heavier displacement boat, you don't bounce around as much. So keep that in mind. He says that as well. If you're on a performance really light cat, what ends up happening is every wind gust, every wave, you feel it. You're like right on the top of the water and you're bouncing around like a cork. So if you aren't interested in that kind of feel, then you want a boat like this. It's a heavier displacement boat. 
He's like, we, as he said, we're going to be on this boat for a very long time. And the percentage of time that we'll actually be crossing oceans where maybe performance would be a benefit is going to be such a minor yeah. percentage, a small fraction of our full, like our time. Most of our time we'll be anchoring and, you know, coastal cruising. So yeah, I want all the comforts. Yeah. And, and You're going to spend five stuff. to 10% of the time actually crossing yeah. body, big bodies of water. Most of the time, especially if you're in the Caribbean or any of these islands where it's a five hour sail to the next one. If you're doing like we easily could do eight knot uh, per hour averages, no problem at all. Now let's say the performance boat next to you is doing a 10 knot and you're doing an eight knot and you're only on a five hour passage or a 12 hour, the best case, your buddy in the performance cat's going to get there like half an hour before you. It's not going to be a huge deal. It's only when you start crossing huge oceans that that person with an extra two knots of speed is going to make uh, knock a couple of days off their passage. But if they're bouncing around like a cork and, it's very uncomfortable. They might get there. And Steve said this on their performance cat. He said, we'd cross and we'd be buddy boating with somebody in a much heavier displacement boat. We'd get there ahead of them, but we'd be exhausted when we get there. They would get there and they're like anchoring. All right, let's go to shore. There's a beach party. Let's do it. And they're like, no, we're tired. We got to go to bed. So he says, we'd get there first, but we'd be exhausted from the pounding that they took on the passage while the person in the heavier displacement boat would get there rested. Right. So... Yeah, she's excited. Rested. So, uh, yeah, she likes to sleep. Yeah. Um, Kevin Clark says, you look like you lost weight. I think it looks the same as when he left because he was pretty in pretty good shape when he left. He lost weight before leaving yeah, as well. I so think probably I since maybe the yeah. last time you put, he did a video filming, he has lost weight. I think I left and I was 210. I weighed myself when I got back and I'm 211. So I gained a pound and I think I lost muscle. That's a downside to being on a boat too, on long passages. And this was like a marathon session. We would get to a place, stay for what was supposed to be two days and ended up being three or four. But nonetheless, you're in a hot climate. You're sweating all the time. You're not really thinking about, I got to go and do some cardio workout. So you spend a lot of time just trying to stay out of the sun. You're sweating profusely and you're not doing any cardio or workout. So I think I lost a little bit of muscle. Um, and because of the kind of not healthy diet, I probably gained Carbs a little bit cheese. of fat. Carbs and cheese. So. But I haven't really gained any. Probably there was a couple so. pounds in there that might come out of the next. Couple yeah, and a couple. I'll start getting back on vegetables, and I'll get it out of my system. So, cheese really gums you up. Let's just say <laughs> that. So, um, what is that in here? Oh, uh, Jer and Wiz is wondering what island is that Brazil island. It is way off the coast. Like it doesn't look mm -hmm. like it's anywhere near Brazil. It's yeah, like, it's kind know. of on the direct route from St. Helena to the Caribbean. That's the reason we picked it. Um, but it was expensive and it was even expensive to get flights because you can't fly from that island to anywhere other than back to Brazil. So Steve had to fly from this Fernando de Nerona to, I forget what main city in Brazil. And then he was there overnight or something. And then he had to fly from there to some other spot and then fly from there to California. It ended up being quite an expensive flight mm -hmm. from there, but it was kind of like on a direct path to the Caribbean. Otherwise we were going to have to go like due West to hit like, uh, whatever main city in Brazil and then go up, it would have added a lot of days to our uh, already delayed passage. So he didn't want to uh, inconvenience us, but he also couldn't wait all the way to Grenada. So when we got to, everything seemed to be 12 days, except for the first passage. We did from Cape Town to Namibia was five days, maybe six at the most. Um, then from there to St. Helena was 12 days. From St. Helena to Fernando de Nerona was 12 days. And from Fern Fernando de Nerona to Grenada was 12 days. So it was really weirdly broken up that it all worked out to be about the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger C68 is wondering, because you were homesick on this trip. Do you think you will be homesick on the future when we live on a boat? No. I won't. Because we'll be together. Yeah. And I don't care about the home at all. I have no emotional attachment to this house at all. Yeah. Like he already lived in it when I moved in. So what happened? I owned a house, he owned a house. I sold my house. Yeah. I bought half the equity in this house. But I've never felt like like it's special to me or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it's not the house. Yeah. It's yeah, it's, it's the people you're around. Yeah, you my kids it. and and yeah. uh, because in the plan all along has been that we're gonna leave. Like I pretty much booted my son out of town. I said I like strongly pushed and pushed him to move to Toronto because he's uh, artsy. He doesn't speak French. There's nothing for him in Ottawa. And when we're gone in four years, there'll be nothing, nothing yeah. like nothing for him here. Uh, so he's taking film and intends to work in the film industry in Toronto. Um, and so like now he's moved away. there. Like I pretty much, when he went to school this year in Toronto, I told him that you shouldn't come back. You should root there. You should get a job there. Yeah. Get to know people there. Um, establish yourself because if you want to work in film, there's nothing here for you. Yeah. And so I visit him a lot all the time. 
Yeah. So, but uh, you know, and then my home is where your you, yeah, well, yeah, where your like, heart is. So, if everybody straight. can come to us yeah. regularly, and that's probably yeah. what we're gonna uh, mm -hmm. try and promote, is you need a vacation from your job because both our kids yeah. are, are going to be working definitely. Well, by then, yeah. Um, it's, it's and be, should be stable by then. In the they'll need vacation, and they're going to get a free vacation if they come and visit us. Mm -hmm. So, if we're like in the Caribbean or if we're oh. in some uh, Hawaii or somewhere, we'll say, look, mm -hmm. instead of us flying back to see you in Canada. You fly to us, and we'll pay for your airline, mm -hmm. or what if you know? Depending but, on their but financial. But part of the situation. deal when we first made this plan was that I'll go home once a year, yeah, if it's possible. Like, but not in the winter. Uh, summer and spring here is beautiful. Yeah, I don't care really about Christmas either. Yeah. I'm not coming home at Christmas and paying double the price to be here during the winter. Uh, I'll come during the spring and summer mm -hmm. to visit my kids. Um, yeah, but that's it. Other than that, I don't care about uh, this house i don't care about this town <laughs> yeah I any family members much. that we, yeah. we will, will miss will often invite them to yeah. come visit us and so we'll see them at least at least once a year if not yes. more so that's the that's the plan have them come to us i mean who doesn't want a free vacation where they get to live on a catamaran in some beautiful place right so i don't think it'll be hard to sell them on coming to visit us so no. did you reef at night um with the parasailer so we had predict wind which is an amazing technology which you know has five different algorithms from different people that predict where the wind's going to be, and they almost all kind of agree. Um, so you really have a good like five, six days of notice of what the wind's going to be. So especially the close-up stuff, like the, that that night when it's the afternoon and you're trying to decide should we leave the parasailer up all night or should we take it down and put up this Genoa? And and uh, we would look and go anything up to especially going downwind, 25 knots of wind. Um, so your parent is like. I think up to the, the that sail is rated to up to 20 knots of apparent wind. So it's almost like you've got to get 30 knots of real wind to get 20 knots of apparent wind. So when the forecast was, oh, it's going to be 12 to 15, we always said, let's add five to that. And would we still be within the threshold? So if it was 15 is the high of gusts, of, you know, 12 to 15 is the range. And we'd say, okay, let's say it gets up to 20. Can we live with that? And we'd say, yeah, we can, because that's, that's fine. I mean, we went up to, I think we got as high as 24, 25 apparent. Uh, and the and it didn't do anything to the sail. The boat just goes a lot faster. You can hear the boat flying through the water when you're going downwind, and, it, and you get a big gust coming. Um, squalls. The only time we ever took the sail down was when there was a lot of squalls around us, because you can't count on squalls. They're freaky. The wind changes angle. All of a sudden, it goes from 12 knots of wind to 30 knots of wind, like for no reason, for like an hour. Um, so we had squalls around us. We took it down and put up the, the Genoa. We often call they often called it a screecher. You might hear us call it a screecher on the episode because that's what North Sales calls it as a screecher. Um, but I call it a Genoa. So we would change from the parasail to a Genoa, which is a heavier sail, can withstand pretty much bulletproof. Um, if there were squalls, or if the weather was saying it's gonna be up to 25 knots, because then we would say, well, 25 might end up being 30, maybe 35, it's too much. We take it down. If it was less than that, if it was saying it's gonna be 12 to 15 overnight, we would just take our chances and leave it up. But we all knew that if anybody some crazy change happened. It was all hands on deck. Everybody gets up from their bed and comes up and we uh, douse the, uh, this spinnaker. So we, if we got super windy days, we did um, um, reef the mainsail down to a double reef sometimes. And uh, the Genoa is a furled Genoa, so you can furl it in a bit. So we would furl it in. But we, we found that, especially this screecher, it was bulletproof. So you didn't really, we didn't have any winds above, let's say 35. So we, and we're mostly going downwind, so we didn't need to worry about it. Um, so that was your parasail? Oh yeah, parasail? would I choose a parasail over a spinnaker? You know what's funny? Is when we first put the parasail up, the way it was designed is you have two downhaul lines uh, on the corners of the sail and then two, two uh, sheets, like spinnaker sheets. And the way it's supposed to be is you've got the downhaul, but you also have the sheets. So you pull one down and release one. And it was this weird, it was, the four lines were just too complicated and one line would always end up rubbing on one of the uh, stainless steel rails on the side or we rub on the seat at the front and things was rubbing all the time and we were just like this is not safe and then in the dark things are going to rub things could chafe through it, it we ended up realizing we don't need four lines we only needed two so we got rid of two and then we were able to put the sail out wide enough that we weren't rubbing on anything and um i hated the parasail the first day or two i was like this is i'm never buying this sail this thing's this thing's too much of a pain in the ass. But then once we realized we didn't need to set it up the way we originally had it set up, um, it ended up being like a, like a spinnaker. But the parasail has that vent in the middle that releases 
And that's why it can handle more gusts is it's got a vent in the middle. So if it really starts blowing, more wind goes through the, the vent and therefore the sail stays static. It doesn't swing around as much as the spinnaker does. The spinnaker kind of, it it's trying to dump air. So what happens is if you get a lot of wind, the thing starts to waver and then it gets a little, you're worried it's gonna twist on itself and stuff. With a parasail, because it's got the vent, it just sort of sits there, static. And it was a great sail. I would definitely, you know, if we saw one used and we were wanting to pick it up, <laughs> then I would definitely get a parasail. So it is good. Um, Robert Mechie, what Mechie, M C E C C H I. What was your typical S O G and T W S? Speed, speed over ground. Um, typical. Um, I think conservatively, I'd say we averaged about seven knots a day or an hour per for the whole the whole voyage. Some days we would have an eight knot average. Some days we would have a six knot average. Um, like I say, when we had perfect weather conditions, we were sailing along at 11 knots consistently, but that's kind of like on a beam reach on good wind and the waves aren't crazy high, uh, kind of like perfect conditions. Um, we got up to highest speed we got to was 17 knots, but I'm sure a little bit of that is we were probably surfing down a wave. Uh, sometimes we got some pretty long and big swells. So you get up on a big swell and next thing you know, you're kind of going downhill for a little bit. So our, our, I mean, this boat had amazing Garmin instruments and it had everything tracked constantly. So you would see your high speed for the day and all this stuff. Um, but it, let's be honest, when it says the high speed for the day, it was probably as you were surfing down a wave, not your constant speed. So there's our speed over ground. I'd say um, count on a seven on an average, Yeah. especially going downwind. Eric Pr Prescott, is our, when are you going to get your turtle or shell back tattoo? Oh, pff, yeah, no. Not no. getting a tattoo. We're doing tattoos. We're gonna get Canadian. She always tells it to me on live no. episodes. I'm like, I what? want on the back of my like a maple leaf and a trillium. Okay. Yeah, the quads always get their blurred leaves. Well, I'm gonna get a nice ornate maple leaf with a pretty trillium. I'm Ontario Canadian. I don't know what I'll do. If it's something that you really means, you should get a maple leaf. Uh, We're talking about work. I work at uh, National Defense, and obviously, like. Maybe, maybe military I'll guys. Leave, just to show I'm Canadian. Canadians do get treated better abroad than uh, Americans. Yeah. And people assume you're American unless you have something to identify. Yeah, yourself. other than Ascension Island, nobody asked Canadians to get a visa. It was amazing. You go to any island or any country, Brazil or whatever, and they're like, oh, these are the, uh, these are the countries that need a visa to come in here. And Canada was never listed as one of them. So it is nice to be Canadian. I think everybody just sort of thinks that we're nice. And so they're not worried about us coming into the country. So it's good yeah. that way to be Canadian. Jeremy um, said, asked, did you have to motor it off? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We, not a lot, but I mean, there was, well, well yeah, it's okay. Let's talk about that. The doldrums, uh, the intertropical convergence zone near the equator. It's actually north of the equator, at least when we went through there. It was around from three degrees north of the equator to about eight degrees north of the equator. We were in the doldrums. And um, yeah, I don't want to crush your cast. <laughs> um, it would be it hurt you more than it would hurt me. Um, so the doldrums were there where we were getting like, low wind it was like enough wind that if you were really not in a rush to get anywhere you could just throw your spinnaker up there and go yeah we'll sail along at four knots um you know but four was kind of like watching paint dry <laughs> especially since sometimes we were in a current that was assisting us so we get four knots but we were probably sailing at three knots um and there was just times we were like oh we're already so far behind on this trip let's just turn the motor on and and once you of course once you're going down wind and you turn the motor on your spinnaker collapses because you're going as fast as the wind. So then we just say, okay, let's just take the spinnaker down and uh, and motor. So I think during the doldrums, we motored pretty much for three straight days, three to four. So that was kind of, yeah. Now, like I said, if you were really trying to conserve diesel or you were really not in a rush to get anywhere, you could just sail through the doldrums. It'll be slow, but it could be done. So. Um. David H. H. asked, how uh, did the water maker keep up after it's fixed? Did it keep up with demand? And yes. was there an issue with the number of people versus? No, it was an amazing, it was an amazing automated uh, water maker. On my first transatlantic, they had the, you know, if you've got a water maker, they have the one where you got to turn the levers and there's a little beaker with like a ball in it. And you got to get the pressure perfectly until you're really kind of having to manually adjust it. This was the most easy uh, it was from Spectra, the most easy mm -hmm. water maker ever. You literally say, start, you punch in how many gallons you want to make. Now you can even do an auto 
if there's a sensor, I don't think this boat had the sensor in the tank that said it's full, but if you did have that set, you could say, start making water, auto, go. And it would just fill until the tank was full and then it would stop. We didn't have that, so we had to say, okay, it's all digital, it's on the iPad. It would say tank, you know, port tank is 100% full and starboard tank is 70% full. And so he, we knew how many gallons it had and, and Sean would just, he was always almost always in charge of that. He would just say, oh, we're 70%. I wanna always make sure that the tanks are full overnight so that in the morning we wake up. In case the water maker broke, you wanted to have your tanks full. Um, so you could just live on the tank water you have. So he would just punch in, oh, we need 30 gallons or 40 gallons. And he would just say 40 gallons and then stop. And so it would do the 40 gallons and then it would stop and it would it would purge, it would backwash its filters and do all that stuff. The reason the tank, the reason the, the water maker stopped working is we're almost 100% sure now that we had a defective membrane. Where there's two membranes, uh, so there's two tubes with a membrane in it. And um, right from the get-go when we left Cape Town, they decided that 700 parts per million is considered acceptable or lower. And anything above that is not really great water. Like you can use it to shower and stuff, but maybe drinking is a little weird. So when we left Cape Town, we were noticing our average was like four or 500 parts per million. And then as we got to Namibia, um, we were going through all these um, jellyfish and other stuff. And then all of a sudden our parts per million went above 800. So we decided we can't drink this water. So we were like panicking, how do we fix it? And they did some cleaning filters and backwashing a bunch of times and they got it down to below 700. And then as soon as we left Namibia towards St. Helena, the water maker started creating crap water again. And that's why when we got to St. Helena, uh, Rudolph showed up and, and they, he brought new membranes. And we figured out maybe it's a membrane issue. And once we replaced the two membranes, the water maker was fine after that. So we think that we just had a, well, end up we figured one membrane because they changed one membrane and then the other, and one membrane was definitely defective. Um, so, lesson learned: if you get a Spectra automatic water maker, it's probably a great water maker. But if you start off from the get go and you're already getting kind of eh, average, like not great but okay water, it should give you really low. Water. When we got the two clean filters in there, it was giving us under 200 parts per million, like 190, 160 parts per million with good membranes. And when we never got that good of water when we left Cape Town. So I think right from the get-go, it didn't have a good membrane. Um, Scotty E from the A, what was the passage food that you loved or hated and what did you wish you had? Well, there was obviously steak. They did buy a lot of meat and there was steak um, that, that's, I, I mean, let's face it, even though I don't eat a lot of meat, when I do eat meat, steak is definitely on the top of my list. Um, when we had the mahi-mahi, fresh caught mahi-mahi was amazing. Um, so that was good. Um, okay. yeah, we had, we had pork chops and we had sausages and stuff. I mean, I, I'm okay with it. Like I said, I'll eat meat. I don't have like any religious thing or any reason that I don't eat meat. It's just because I've read enough books that says meat's not good for you. So, um, in small doses, I, I love meat in small doses. So as a, the plate should be like 80% vegetables and like 20% meat, or if you can get away with it, no percent meat, get, get rid of protein from other things. But but when you go to somebody's house and they're having a barbecue and they're making burgers or whatever, I'm like, I'm not going to be difficult. I'm not going to say I don't eat I don't eat meat because I'm vegetarian or whatever. I'll just eat it and say, oh yeah, well it's not going to kill me. It's just don't don't eat it every day. So, what did you miss the vegetables? The Salad, like holy crap! Like there wasn't one piece of lettuce on this boat. Even when we made burgers, you're like, we're we're having burgers and there's of course there's tons of cheese on it because we had so much cheese. It'd be burger cheese bun and i'm like okay what are we putting on it they're like there's ketchup and there's mustard they didn't have relish they didn't have lettuce they didn't have tomatoes no they didn't pickles, have no pickles. Tomato, I'm like what are you kidding me like how do we not even have like some condiment that's a vegetable based condiment so it was it was crazy so um so i will google what is a marquesian maple leaf tattoo thank you our salty hulls a marquesian yeah he says i should get a marquesian maple leaf tattoo i've never even heard of that so i don't know what it's that well my get it in the marquesas oh a marquesas okay yeah yeah okay they're probably really big into tattoos that makes more sense i thought it was a marquesian is part of canada i've like, never heard of that so uh, did you run with the main as well as the parasol asking no staff no no, asking. no no we didn't ever Going downwind, we never got the main involved. It just doesn't add a lot of value. You don't go any obviously faster. The other thing too that you've got to keep in mind is your uh, catamaran has very sloped back uh, standing rigging. 
So if you put your mane out, especially if you're making it a little bit loose to catch the wind from behind, it's very easy. If you put it out too far, it's going to touch your standing rigging. And you're, you don't want your sail rubbing on your standing rigging or you'll wear a hole right through it. So as soon as we we're going downwind, the main was kind of useless because all it does is block the wind that's going to hit your spinnaker or if you're using your Genoa. So if we're going downwind or mostly downwind, we just either ran with the Screecher or the Genoa or the Parasailer. We just didn't even bother with the, the main. It just and the other thing too with the main, when you're in a catamaran and you're hitting getting waves from the side, the boat's kind of doing this. And what ends up happening is your main, it's on a, you know, on a sheep, it's constantly jerking against the sheet. So you're getting this as your boat's doing the, the little jiggle. So, it, you know, it's just not good. It, it, it puts a lot of strain on your main. It puts a lot of strain on your, your uh, lines and stuff. It's just, and it doesn't add a lot of speed. So we don't use the main. When we used it was when we were on a beam reach on the way to Grenada. Grenada. We had the main and the screecher out and we were flying like, like, Averaging 11, but times we were doing 14 knots, and the boat—it sounds like like your boat's a jet boat, like the, the like uh, what do you call it? A rooster tails at the back. It was crazy. So this boat could actually sail really fast when you're doing a beam a beam reach. Um, but you want those perfect conditions. You want it windy, but you don't want huge waves coming at you from the side. You know, so you get that thing where the the ocean hasn't really gotten huge in the waves, but the wind is good. You can absolutely absolutely fly, especially considering the mono haulers. And I, uh, fastest I've ever sailed my boat is I'm about not. seven and a half knots. Oh, okay. Seven and a half knots is probably the fastest I've ever had my boat going. So when you're sailing along at 14 knots, you're like, wow, this is this is insane. So, um, David H, how did the um, the boat keep up with the electrical demand? And was the electric generated by solar? And yeah, that's a good question. Gen yeah. set. Or? So generally, Sean always liked having everything topped up all the time. So he was always making water, which of course runs off your batteries. So that was a drain on the battery. So solar, if we had a perfectly sunny day, I think he has almost 2,000 watts of solar. That's a lot of solar. But let's face it, sometimes your sails are up, you've got shade from your sails on your solar. So, Or the sun's not at noon. It's not directly above your boat. It's off to the side. So you're not going to get the full 2,000 watts. Um, so we had solar, which could keep up with the, the usage during the day for sure. Everything ran off solar. But as soon as the sun went down, you're still running your autopilot and you're maybe even producing water overnight and you're and you're everybody's got their laptops and their iPads plugged in overnight so we're just constantly drawing off the batteries which were lithium ion they're an amazing battery system i would only have lithium ion batteries on our future, future boat, boat yes. because you can use lithium ion batteries from 100% to all the way down to 20% like that's the don't go below definitely don't go below the way this system was worked it was a master volt system and at 40% of your batteries, uh, it would set off a little like alarm, not alarm, the screen would pop up saying you're at 40%, like you probably wanna do something. At 30%, I think it actually shuts off everything but the essentials, like it won't shut off your autopilot, but it'll shut off like, theoretically, it'll shut off your fridges, it'll shut off everything that uh, aren't absolutely essential because it doesn't want you to go below 30, even though theoretically a lithium ion system can go all the way down to 20 before it starts to damage the batteries. As opposed to a lead acid battery, you don't even wanna go close to 50% of the battery or you'll start to damage your cells. So there's more capacity on a lithium ion battery. They're way lighter and you can charge them way faster than lead acid batteries or even gel batteries. So I totally think, um, I know Exquisite, they're gonna eventually um, make lithium ion the standard that that's all you get. But right now they're still offering the lead acid batteries. And I asked, what's it cost to go to the lithium ion, which includes, a much stronger uh, alternators on your engine that can charge the batteries faster and everything. And I think he said the total upgrade price for that lithium ion system was $10,000, which in the grand scheme of things, you're buying a 1.2 <laughs> or one, no, $1.3 million boat. I mean, if you, you're you gonna spend the $10,000 to get a better battery system for sure. Um, anyways, we'll definitely do that. If we get a boat and it's used and it doesn't have lithium ion batteries, we'll pay to upgrade it to uh, real, bad, well, real good batteries, so. Jerry and Weiss is Wondering if you're off cheese now, still eating cheese. We did not buy cheese, but we did a big grocery today. He did not buy cheese. No. A break from cheese is I don't eat cheese. I actually don't eat cow dairy. Yeah. So we haven't bought cheese with our groceries in a very long time. Yeah. Cow dairy makes me bloated. Like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I won't get into it. Anyways, I have knee arthritis, and when I eat cow dairy, it causes inflammation in me, and it makes my knee arthritis act mm -hmm. up. I cut cow dairy a couple years ago and I haven't had the knee arthritis issue since. 
So if I'm going to have anything dairy related, it's goat cheese. But normally yeah. I get to have almond milk or, or yeah. coconut milk if I'm going to need some kind of milky stuff. Yeah. For, for breakfast, we don't we don't have milk in our house. Nope. So I for breakfast, our groceries, I have oatmeal milk. with blueberries every day. And as a just to make it a little more moist so it's not dry, I put a little mm. almond milk on it and that's it. So we don't have milk and yeah. we don't have really So like cheese has not been in our grocery list for very yeah. long. I don't remember so the picture, last time I bought a block of marble cheese that I used yeah, to buy, no. you know, mozzarella. We used to. I mean, yeah, a few couple of years ago, big we used to bricks of mozzarella. And, so no, yeah. we don't buy cheese. Mm -hmm. Will you stay? Yeah, but so we sh he should have gone to buy Coke and rum for himself. I did in Namibia. Oh, he did. Okay. So I like Sean drank Coke. So there was Coke on board, but not a lot because he thought he was the only one who would drink Coke. Because um, I generally don't just drink Coke for the sake of drinking Coke. I'll no, I, don't, I don't like pop unless there's more. Yeah. Limited. So I, when we were in <laughs> Cape Town, and I said, "Oh, what?" Do you, I noticed the beer when I first got there, and I'm like, "Are we going to put some rum on the boat?" And Sean's like, "No, I don't think we need rum." And I'm like, "Oh, okay." And then. We left, and then I thought about it afterwards. They're drinking beer every day, and I had nothing. So I was like, when I got to Namibia, I'm like, I'm hitting the liquor store, and I'm buying some rum. So I bought three bottles of rum um, and ended up drinking with Sean because then Sean, once I had it on boat, board, he started drinking some too. I think I got through one and a half bottles of rum, so there's still one and a half bottles on the boat when I left. So we didn't drink rum that often. I, I mean, it's weird because when we were sailing, it's almost socially acceptable to have a beer while you're mm – -hmm. it's almost like pop to some guys – um, but I would never sit there on on watch going, oh, I'm thirsty. I'm going to have a rum and coke while I'm on watch. So, but it was seemed to be socially acceptable for people to have a beer while they were on watch. So, it's kind of different, even though it's alcohol. It coke or rum and coke sounds like a I want to hard liquor get a good party. glow going on your rum and coke, and when you're just sipping a beer, people are like, it's okay, it's okay, it's not really alcohol. So, that's at least how it was treated. So, um. So, uh, Scotty E from the A, what are some good small luxuries to have during a night watch? Um, not really, not really acceptable. Even though, in the grand scheme of things, you're in the middle of the ocean and you have AIS, you have a huge chart plotter with AIS and radar, split screen. You can see everything coming. Lights in the middle of the ocean. It's pitch dark. You can see any boat light from miles and miles away. So, realistically, you only need to scan your surroundings every. Thank you for that, on my arm. Sorry. Um, you only need to scan your surroundings every 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I mean, let's face it, nothing's going to come from, can't even see it to right on top of you in 15 minutes. Um, so you really only need to scan. So theoretically, you could do whatever you want on your watch as long as every 15 or 20 minutes you look around. But generally, none of us watched a movie or did any sort of like where your tensions on something else when you were on watch. Um, so what I would suggest to keep yourself mentally stimulated is audiobooks. So you put your earbuds in and you sort of sit at your home station and you look around and then you're observing everything around you, but you're still not like, like a lot of times too, in the middle of the night, you're the only one awake. <laughs> so you yeah. want to have somebody talking to you or some sort of stimulation to your brain to keep you awake uh, and audiobooks or podcasts or whatever you yeah. have loaded is, is definitely the way to go. I'm going to spa. That's what I'll paint my toes and do. Yeah. Things like that. <laughs> yeah. She'll do something like that, but I'll just, I just listen to audiobooks. So I got through like, six books during this trip so that's when i'll like soak my feet and yeah you know. i'm worried she's gonna like i have to i can't stay awake i will need to uh, do I, something to i'm gonna have to get up on her watch and make sure she hasn't fallen asleep. i will definitely be one of the i will need to be setting the alarm ding every 15 minutes because even i can't trust me i'll yeah. go from wide awake to unconscious so. the middle of the ocean is kind of one of those times like we talked about this uh, the crew talked about this like People who solo sail or maybe just when it's just a couple and one person's like whatever seasick or whatever and the other person's the only one really operating the boat, it's probably not even a big deal to not have a 24-hour watch on the middle of the ocean because there's nothing out there, nothing out there. And the chances of you hitting another boat in the middle of the ocean is like one in a million. So if you did just decide, you know, wife's been seasick, she's not even awake, and I've been up for 15 hours straight and I really just need to lay down for four or five hours of sleep and let the autopilot do its thing. The grand scheme of things is probably not a big deal because you're in the middle of nowhere. It's like being in the well, middle of the sailors do it. They cannot yeah, there's solo sailors. Off. They'll tell you that they do a 20 minute nap cycle, but I think the reality is they probably sleep longer than that. And they just, just set an alarm, a perimeter alarm or some kind. Of yeah. They, and that's it. you got modern technology. Now you got yeah. AIS, you got radar. You can set alarms that says if anything gets within five nautical miles of me, it sets an audible alarm. So if you're sleeping near your your helm, you can just set an alarm and it'll go off. I mean, 
So grand schemes. But because there was four of us and we only had three hour shifts, um, there wasn't any reason you'd be sleeping on your watch. So you just sort of sat and looked around. Now you could look from the helm station inside. There's a helm station inside with windows all the way around. So when we first left Cape Town, it was freezing cold. So most of the time, at least I, I know I can't speak for everybody. I spent most of my watch sitting at the interior helm, looking out the windows. Um, you know, you turn off all the lights in the cabin so you can see perfectly out and you're comfortable and you can see all the instruments and you can even change the autopilot angle from inside the boat. So you don't need to sit out in the exposed helm if you don't want to. Now, when we were in the near, near the equator and you're like, it's hot all the time, you wanted to sit outside to get the fresh air because inside the boat was a little more stuffy. So. Mm -hmm. um so David H, tell us about the stars, the Milky Way, and did you see any bioluminescence? Yeah, um, bioluminescence was there. It wasn't as bright, in my opinion, as I did in the North Atlantic crossing. Um, I'm thinking that's true, and maybe I was just so enthralled with it the first time it just felt brighter. But yeah, I look back and I thought about filming it, but it wasn't nearly as bright or as, or as thick in bioluminescence. So. Um, I did tell, pull out the camera at one point to see if it would even show up on the film and it didn't really felt like it did. So I didn't film it after that. Uh, I did film the stars a few times. Um, it's harder on video than it would be in stills. If you're on land, you can put a tripod, you can uh, open up your aperture fully and then, and then make your shutter speed long so that it, it really captures a lot of light and you can get some amazing uh, astrophotography. But because we're in a moving boat, you can't do that you can't open up your uh, shutter long because the boat's constantly bouncing and moving and so everything would be blurry um so i filmed with uh 24 frames per second a few times got the moon and you know with the sail in the background and and stuff so i have some of that little becoming but um it i don't think it is as impressive on film as you probably would see with your naked eye um the milky way is there every night as long as there's no clouds you can see it it's great um i saw shooting stars all the time i didn't see a satellite coming down in the middle of the ocean like no, i did on my first time not this time, no, no, no James satellites. No, so no exciting it was, it's very beautiful, marbles. but it's like anything yeah. I talked to Janice about this. We're from Canada. When you see a sandy beach with palm trees, you're like, oh my God, you're so enthralled with it. So beautiful. Um, but then when you start living around it every day and you see it seeing, it, you just get used to it. Same thing with the stars. Um, you know, the first few nights when we left Cape Town and it was pitch dark and you're looking up at the Milky Way and the stars, you're like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. And then after a week of that or two weeks of that or three weeks of that, you kind of look up and go, yeah, the stars are nice. And you don't get that excited about it anymore because it's, it's just around you all the time. So, um, Jerry and Lisa wants to know, what did you listen to in your audiobooks? I listened to every podcast I had preloaded. I watched every YouTube video that I preloaded on my phone. I reloaded a lot of stuff. Um, and then uh, books, I, I was watching, uh, listening to a series, it's like a sci-fi series, and I went through five books back to back of a, uh, of a, oh, that one that was turned into a TV show, oh. The Expanse. Oh, The Expanse. Yeah, uh, but it's not called The Expanse in the book, it's called something else. But they, they made a TV show called The Expanse that is based on that book series by, uh, uh, what's, that, what's the author's name? Anyways. It's a, it's the TV show, The Expanse. Google it. That is based on the book series that I'm reading or audio listening to. Um, Nathan Alisi, are, there, there's a Can-Am festival in Sackett's Har Harbor this weekend, and are we going to that? We don't have an what's, agenda. What's a Can-Am festival? Is that a, is that a power boat thing again? That sounds like a sailing power boat down thing. for the Can-Am. I don't know what that was. Can-Am. Usually, anything that's like a Can-Am sounds like a, a, a power boat thing. So. Yeah, I don't think there's a Can-Am sailing thing. Um, anyways, we're not power boaters. I mean, it's cool to see the jet boats going yeah, by. Yeah, to, watch, to, have them, to watch them blow by. It's kind of fun. Yeah. But yeah, we're not power boaters, so we wouldn't go to a festival, especially if there's a festival. Oh, it's yet. a three-wheeler motorbike. Okay. And no? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Not really into that. And if you go to a place where there is a oh, festival Oh, someone asked earlier today. if you're going to be riding your motorcycle in D.C., but we haven't, we couldn't even put insurance on the bike this year. And... Pretty sure we're not going to be riding the motorcycle at all. Oh, there was a guy who offered to have us come visit him and ride on one of his bikes in DC. Oh, maybe it was that guy. Yeah. Oh, whoops. Nothing. We haven't heard from you, so send us an email. Uh, no, I, I wrote it down. Um, Medved. One. Okay, I had to read my own writing. Okay. She's got horrible writing. She gave me the. She wrote. Questions. She wrote a bunch of questions for you guys to for me to read when I was on the uh, voyage. Funny. And when I got on the boat, I'm looking at her handwriting. I'm like, I have no idea who this is. I don't half read what even the question is. So in I hindsight, I'm like, bad writing. I'm like, man, no, why I, did I, I let her I write stuff? I talked to text. Crazy. Do you think so I'm, 
I didn't, A, because I didn't get to daily vlog. I, I planned to answer some of the questions that you guys gave me before I left. But then, A, I didn't get to daily vlog like I was hoping. I became more of a documentary videographer where I was like, I, I film stuff and I with the intention of voicing over later because I couldn't vlog. And so I didn't get to do the questions. But I did have that piece of paper with me and I tried to read it and I'm like, 80% of these questions are un unreadable. So I'm sorry. I couldn't figure out how I can type it. way like super okay. fast when I have two hands. Move on to the next question. Then uh, better that than writing. The question. I'll have, okay, let me do this because no, me, me. One second here. One second here. I'll find Take it. the car keys away from Janice. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ron. I said the same thing. I said, this is not the first car accident she had. I said, thank God she didn't crash my car. So I did two or three. They've all been my We're in Namibia. <laughs> oh, sorry. Let me do this okay. because you're bypassing questions now. Okay. Where in Namibia was Walvis Bay. Namibia was the, There's two. There's Walvis Bay, and then there's a, a port south of it. I forget what it's called now. Walvis Bay is where you want to go because the dunes and all these places that are are around are near Walvis Bay and Swakop or whatever it's called is a town north of Walvis Bay. So you do not want to go to the Anchorage South in Namibia because then you have further to travel to get to all of these uh, picturesque excursion spots. Um, Predicament looked like you guys were cooking along at seven, eight knots most of the time. Yeah, I'd, I'd start, I'm just saying when someone asked me um, what the speed of the boat is. I don't want to say we'd average an eight knot day. I mean, we did definitely average eight knot days and I'd maybe even a few days where we hit nine knots as an average, but that's, I don't want to over promise and, and then under deliver. So I'd say if you want to say, if you're doing a long passage, you say, well, what can I average as my speed? I'd say you could average seven knots. So. Uh, medication can fix you. Oh, medication for seasons. Yeah, like in hindsight, we'll have some next time. there are little patches you can put behind your ear that supposedly are like oh, release medicine. Go. Medved Wanders. That's what it was that I couldn't read. So, uh, Medved Wanders. We bought motorcycling in DC. James says, uh, James Winter says, uh, we love your Facebook page. That was definitely where I would point people on my app, the uh, Cruising Up Duty app. There is a link to the Facebook page. That's way easier for us to update in real time. So sometimes we get so far behind in footage mm -hmm. that I'm editing stuff that I actually did months ago. But when we're out doing something, we might take a photo or, or put a post on Facebook. So if you're kind of like, mm -hmm. I really want to know what they're up to right now, not what they did three months ago, then go to our Facebook page and uh, follow the Cruising Off Duty Facebook page. It's definitely more real time. Yeah, Robert uh, Flindel is going to be at Annapolis for the first time. If yeah. Yes, stop and say hello. Yeah, definitely. If you see us, we'll probably be wearing our, at least I will be wearing this. Oh, I got the girl shirts for, oh. with that new stuff. So that's a girl shirt. Ooh, uh, so it's cut for women because before I only used to have men's shirts. So. Yeah. yeah, I think I even got you a uh, tank top. But anyways, and we got a sweatshirt too back there somewhere. But anyways, so um, she's got some stuff she might be more willing to wear because I used to have all these men's shirts and she felt they were too manly for her. Well, baggy. Baggy. Like Michigan is record high. Yeah, I'm thinking everything in all the Great Lakes is record high water. It's weird. This is funny because two years ago, yeah, it was huge flooding flood. and everybody's like, this is the hundred year flood. We've never had water like this in over a hundred years. And we thought, oh, this is terrible. What a fluky thing. And then two years later, the water's even higher. Yeah. So clearly there's a change in the ecosystem and the global or what do you call it? Climate the change. Upper watershed. Somehow you know, everything's Northern Ontario melting. where the water comes from. I don't know where it comes from. But, well, but, now it's also, it's most, it's snow melt and yeah. we had a lot of rain. This but way. you got to think how much water there is for the yeah. five great lakes. That's a massive amount mm -hmm. of water in, in between Canada and the United States. Uh, for the water level to be many feet above the average, that's a ton of water. So this isn't just some freaky rainstorm that flooded it or some, um, like in the States you get this flooding because a hurricane blows through, but it's a like because of just a lot of rain. We're talking massive amounts of water in these Great Lakes that are way above average, and that's two years in a row. So mm -hmm. uh, how did the program that? Really? Okay. So, so after sailing, working, uh, so any of these that we didn't do? No, I pretty much got it. Was okay. on top of all of them. What? What you should have taken your wife along. She, <laughs> she's a great cook. Yeah. His wife, not, not me. Oh, <laughs> okay. You should have taken it. James said he, James Winter said you should have taken his wife. I was like, him and his wife. I don't know about Janice being a gourmet cook, but she's mm -hmm. uh, she would have been better than what we had. Mm -hmm. And had she had some say in the provisioning, we would have had better yeah. food on board for sure. Yeah. And rum. Oh, yeah. I, like I said, <laughs> for sure. I'm sure a lot of you are like, that sounds awesome. You know, 
steaks and, and cheese and beer and it's perfect and it's great. But it felt like I was housing on a, you know, with a bunch of college students and they decided what they were going to buy. So I'm sure you mean Portuguese and Spanish. I did say that, didn't I? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. So obviously Brazil speaks Portuguese and yeah. uh, English, Spanish. English was hard to find people that would speak English, but you could kind of speak to them in Spanish and they kind of got the gist of it. So they clearly have overlapping language there. Uh, yeah, sorry, just going through it last minute to make sure I didn't miss anything huge. Uh, Hello, Nathan. Hello, James. What's the island near? Brady. Okay, somebody, uh, sorry, Roger68 uh, asked, so this was an eight-week voyage. How do you think this may be different from a full-time on board with Janice without the obvious reasons? Um, like, Again, I felt very comfortable on this catamaran for comfort reasons. Um, I easily could have seen us living full time on this. Uh, this was a bit of a marathon session. So let's just talk about that. Leaving Cape Town, getting all the way to Grenada in this short of time was a bit of a marathon session. We were always in a rush to get on to the next stop. If Janice and I were living on it, this was our floating home. We would spend, well, we spent a lot of time already in Cape Town. So we would spend a lot of time in Cape Town again, but mm -hmm. that was already done once. Um, Namibia and all these other ones, I felt like we were we were provisioning, provisioning, getting fuel. Let's go on a quick excursion. Like we went to the dunes in Namibia and that was epic. Love that. But that was like a one day thing. And the rest of the time it was like, let's provision, let's get going. So uh, when you're living and you're retired and you're not on a, a time crunch, we would have spent more time between all these 12 day passages because you only just finished a 12 day passage and then you provision for two days and then you go on one little like quick excursion and then you get on the boat and you go and then you're doing another 12 days. So it just felt a little rushed. Uh, and without Janice being there, being homesick, it made it felt longer. But when Janice is there, we'll go slower. We'll also have each other there. So it won't feel like, oh God, I'm homesick or any of that stuff. So, so Nathan corrected. It's Canadian American, Can M. Duh, of course. Yeah, we knew that. But um, I guess he means sailing. Um, no, Can M just means Canadian American. I knew that, but I didn't. There's Can M motorcycle things. There's Can M mm, powerboat oh, things. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. He's more sporty than me. Would like to ask you guys about a Mel sailboat. They're beautiful, but I don't want to live in a model, but they are beautiful. Well, that's, what, them that's what Delos has. That's an Amel. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, so nice. Marilou. But I definitely want a cat. Yeah. I'm not living on a model. Yeah, I'm not living on a model. So. Under any circumstances. I'm sure that's a, like Delos loves their boat. And I'm sure yeah. everybody who's oh. ever had that boat has Nothing bad to say at all. Yeah. That's for sure. But it's I a just, monohull. Yeah. So, How did the batteries know. hold up when you turned on the air conditioning? Okay, so air conditioning on our side of the boat. So the crew side or the guest side was on the port side. The owner side was on the uh, starboard side. The starboard side was set up with slow start air conditioning, which can run off the batteries without any generator needing needing to be on. So he was able to air condition his room, the owner, uh, yeah. but we couldn't air condition ours unless the generator was running. Oh, yeah. um, it didn't use, we did a little bit of calculation. I can't remember, Sean would know um, what that, it's not a crazy amount because it's a slow start air conditioning and then it's up to this temperature that you ask for. Let's say you make it 74, it, just to get the humidity out of the air and, and a reasonable sleeping temperature. Once it gets there, it doesn't cost a lot of battery power to keep it at that temperature. It's getting from like 85 or 90 degrees down to 74 uses a fair bit. But once you get there, so what he could do is he could turn on the generator, let us dry out our rooms from all the humidity with the air conditioning running. That would top up the batteries. He would have his air conditioning running as well, which would run with, off the generator slash battery. And then once we all went to bed or whatever, he'd turn off the generator and then he would continue his air conditioning on battery and we would uh, slowly sweat to death. So, um, but the air conditioning in the room when we first went to bed, your, your room is cool and it might be two in the morning, you would wake up and realize now your room is hot. So uh, it was good. Yeah, so we're coming up to two hours. It's kind of long. Yeah, it is long. Okay. <laughs> if there's any last minute questions, fire them right now. Otherwise, we are going to sign off. Probably wrap it up. Is there anything I can think of that I would say? So the um, the trip was well worth it. Oh, like I said, all those firsts I did. Uh, I've never been to Brazil. Never been to Namibia, of course. Never been to San Helena. Everything was a first for me. Crossing the equator for the first time. So many things. If if anybody said, were you happy you you went? Yes. Would you do the exact same voyage again if somebody else said, oh, there's a new exquisite and they want to take you across the uh, and Caribbean? Only if I can come. Yeah. And even then, I might say I've done the equator crossing already. I might. But I haven't. 
Yeah. But I mean, I might say, let's meet you in St. Helena and or wherever, and then do part of the voyage. I don't know if I do the whole thing again. It's a long time, uh, mostly because of work reasons. If we were retired, 100% for sure, I would. But getting that I, much I time off Sean did ask if I could go. Like, it wasn't like I, if I said I can go, yeah, he would have said, no, thank you. Yeah. It just was a matter of my vacation. I would have had to take leave without yes. pay. Yeah. But next time I will take leave without pay yeah. if necessary. Yeah. Chong K, did you give thanks to uh, Neptune when you crossed the ground? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we, what we did is we, like, again, it wasn't a hazing. We weren't, like, forced to do crazy stuff. Um, what we did was we drank. We poured some alcohol into the ocean for Neptune. We flipped a coin. That was another thing that Sean knew about. Flipped a coin into the ocean uh, from a previous port. So each one of us got a coin from the previous port, and we flipped it into the ocean for Neptune. And then Sean, I didn't tell you this, uh, Sean presented us with a, a little uh, – uh, brass um, compass oh, thing. It's nice. really nice. So oh, that was nice. a presentation for oh, crossing. Is that the what's that right there? The leather thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I can't pick it up. Oh, I got my pinky. My pinky's got a lot of exercise. Uh, so yeah, we days. got uh, this from Sean, which is kind of a commemorative crossing the equator thing. So oh, there we go. see? I like it. Oh, it's beautiful. There we go. Oh, thanks, so John. Nice. It's really nice. It has like a little sundial oh, thing. I love it. It opens up. Oh, Anyways. Cool. So that was kind of like our. Thanks for being on the on I the boat that. across the equator. So he got that for us. That's awesome. So that was it. But like again, nothing, no hazing. We weren't like pouring some of the stuff you see on some of these YouTube channels that really make them go crazy at the equator. We didn't do that. Um, and then Sean told me, what about sleeping on deck? Did you try sleeping on? Oh deck? well, part of what I was saying and the reason I couldn't do a, um, a daily vlog is there was somebody always sleeping on deck behind us. Mm -hmm. Tomas did the first passage to Namibia. He slept there, and then once he left, it was so hot after Namibia that uh, Steve, who was sharing a cabin with me, moved from our cabin to the spot that Tomas was sleeping on this kind of big salon bed out behind the uh, helm. So he slept out there. And then when he left in uh, Brazil, Valentin joined the boat and he slept out there. So there was always somebody sleeping out there. Sean had a hammock, the same hammock we have, the I cocoon hammock. hammock. Um, I went on a hike while he was gone with my broken hand and fractured sternum. I went on a backpacking trip and I slept in a hammock. Yeah. Because it was easier than the ground. So that hammock that we have, he has the same one, and he hung it on the back of the boat. Uh, and a few really hot nights, he slept in the hammock out there. Yeah. So yeah, people definitely slept the out there. They're very sleepable, mm -hmm. for sure. Very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. So look forward to the videos. It's going to be, we're on vacation, so we're trying to enjoy the last bit yeah. of our vacation. I'll try and get out an episode a week. Uh, and I don't know 100% how many episodes it's going to be. Uh, it may be eight episodes, uh, nine episodes. I don't know how many episodes it'll be. Uh, we'll sort of... Have to go through the footage and decide what I need to cut and what I don't. And uh, look forward to that. There's a ton of great visual stuff of all the things I've told you about. Uh, obviously, on these live episodes, I can't exactly cut in video footage of stuff we've done, but uh, you'll see it soon enough. So that's it. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for, for watching. Us. And it was lovely. It was, thank you for all your questions. Yeah, awesome. And comments. Good feedback. And uh, your, your bumps of rum money. Yeah, rum money. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. And uh, we don't want to hold you guys any up anymore. I appreciate you guys watching. And until next time, this is Craig and Janice signing off, saying yeah. ciao Bye. for now.